I know why people are as left as they are now. Like, it's not that crazy, you know? We don't hear this rhetoric anymore because we moved into kind of a different era, but Jesus Christ, I remember growing up when I was a staunch Republican, my response to every single fucking thing a Democrat said was, you hate this country. You're not patriotic. You hate the country. You hate the troops. You don't support Iraq. You don't support Afghanistan because you fucking hate the troops. You want our fucking military to die. You want all these people to die, right? This is the rhetoric that Republicans have been giving for the past, you know, decade or two decades. Jesus Christ. In terms of every single possible Democratic argument. Anytime you say like, oh, like maybe we can have more minimum wage. Oh, maybe we can do, uh, you know, maybe more for education. Oh, you want to be like Europe because you fucking hate America, right? Well, Jesus Christ, if you tell a group of people for long enough they fucking hate the country, maybe some of them will start to fucking hate the country country. If loving America means supporting massive amounts of war, supporting the incarceration of people for fucking smoking marijuana, means not approving of things like gay marriage or any other socially left issue, like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that now we've got a generation of people that are on the left that, yeah, maybe they do say fuck America. Because you've told them for their entire fucking lives that uh, advocating for things like an increase of the fucking minimum wage means you're anti-patriotic or saying maybe we shouldn't go to war with all these countries in the Middle East. Oh yeah, well you fucking hate the United States. Okay, well fuck it, I guess they do. Like, I empathize with you a lot because I've been on both sides of it, both in what I believe in and in what I fight against, that rhetoric that is extreme on one side can drive people to the other direction, but it sure. feels like sometimes we have the memory of goldfishes politically that we remember for the past two or three years that uh, 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 Democrats, or at least people on the internet, and even some Democrats will call every mother that disagrees with them, you're racist, you're racist. What's that? You don't believe that we should do this? You're a f***ing racist. That's shitty when Democrats say it, and it's horrible, and it does drive people for the right, but god damn, before that, my name's Rob Noor. I consider myself a populist conservative. I think I'm one of the better conservative uh, debaters that you see on the Twitch platform. Uh, I primarily stream to Twitch because YouTube decides to ban me all the time and give me strikes. So I don't think I'm allowed to post there for another week. But um, you can find me on YouTube at Normal America with Rob Noor. Uh, Twitch, where I stream almost every weeknight around 8 p.m. Eastern time. It's just Rob Noor, as you see it spelled there, all one word, all lowercase, uh, at twitch.tv backslash Rob Noor. So thanks so much for having me. All right, next up, let's bring on Destiny. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. So, yeah, same questions. Uh, what were those again? I'm Destiny. <laughs> I um, I love Joe Biden. Um, yeah, Biden's America. <laughs> Amen. Well, I, I, hold on, I'm fucking with my OBS because I have to do a new fucking thing every single time you guys decide to use a new program to broadcast everything. Uh, so, yeah, sorry God, about that. God, complaining machine tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. What was, uh, okay, what was it, repeat, because some people didn't hear the question the first time, because you mumbled yourself. a lot, yeah. Introduce yourself. yourself. Yeah, I'm Destiny, I do politics on Twitch, and on YouTube at twitch.tv slash destiny, youtube.com slash destiny, and yeah, that's what I do. I'm left, center left, uh, far left, far right, I don't know, it depends on what you call me, but I, I would say that I'm a, like, center left, far left person, I consider myself a social democrat, and as an extension of that, I tend to support my boy Biden, doing big <laughs> things in America, uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. Okay, and if you guys are watching this on the replay, this would, I am dying to see what this will sound like on two times speed because these two are like the fastest talkers freaking on the internet. So Get your watching already. this playback on two times speed will be um will be fun. Um, all right, so yeah, here is what we'll do. Each person could give an opening statement, could be as little as one minute, no longer than five, about the topic and your stance. After that, we'll open up the floor for those watching. If you have questions, tag politically provoked so we know you're talking to us and not the chat. We'll be jotting them down throughout the debate. Because it's a little busy, we'll probably um, only be accepting super chats, but we might be able to get to some good questions as well. So just um, write them anyways. And if it's a good enough question, we'll ask. Also, make sure no families, no girlfriends, no wives. It's off limits. Um, I don't care what you guys type, but they won't be read. So behave. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess we can get started with opening statements. Rob, you want to get us going? Yeah, real quick, just a question. How long are we planning on going? Just influences, but all I want to talk about, that's all. Um, we usually, they usually run about like two hours at the moment. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Works for me. Okay, yeah, I can give an opening statement. Um, yeah, so I don't know exactly what anyone has to defend to claim that Biden and his presidency has been a net positive. Um, there are things that maybe you could say that he did that were okay on certain things, but I don't know how anyone could say that if you had to say whether or not you would consider his presidency good, would say that's the case. So I'll get to my reasons why. First is we have to say that it's not just Joe Biden, but it's actually his administration. And one, that's only fair you would do that with any presidency, but particularly with the Biden presidency, because he's basically not all there. And more than any president in my lifetime, he's a figurehead. Uh, there are people behind the scenes 
that are actually running it. He doesn't know where he's at half the time. Nonetheless, the buck stops with Biden, so that's what we'll be talking about. I've basically broken down into three categories, uh, the areas where I think that Biden is a failure, or perhaps that someone could destiny will argue that he succeeded. The first would be foreign policy. Second would be domestic policy. The third's like more of a catch-all. I would say like scandals or sort of his impression as president and things like that. So uh, on foreign policy, there is no arguing that I could see uh, to make the case that Biden has been a success on foreign policy. Um, he entered his presidency with historic Middle East peace deals. Uh, soon after entering, we saw fighting in the Middle East with Israel, Palestine. We saw the ability we had to bomb Syria because allegedly Iran was attacking U.S. interests there. Um, so we saw disastrous bombing campaigns in Syria violent because a third country did something terrible. Um, we saw France being pissed because at the last minute they were left out of a nuclear sub deal. And that's one of the things that we were told with Biden, he would bring respect back to our allies. Our allies know that he's a joke, like France being upset with this situation. He was censured in the UK because of his disastrous pullout of Afghanistan without correctly working with the UK in order to do so. So you can see that our allies are furious. The Afghanistan debacle was one of the biggest egg on face things that has occurred to the US foreign policy wise since Vietnam. Um, American troops died. Hundreds of Americans were left behind. Uh, he actually allowed Bagram Air Base to be taken over, which allowed ISIS to be freed, which allowed ISIS to then kill our troops. He relied on the Taliban, the very group that freed those ISIS troops for security in Afghanistan and the sole air base that we had left, which was predictably a disaster. He brought a bunch of people in that he claimed were vetted that we now know weren't vetted. Um, so this was a disaster. Then after getting egg on his face, he decided to prove that he was a tough guy by bombing ISIS-K, which actually was was just a bunch of children that he murdered. Um, our enemies are emboldened. We see Russia being emboldened with Ukraine. We see China being emboldened with Taiwan. Foreign policy is a disaster. Domestic policy, some of the big areas that I think we could hit on COVID, his COVID policies have been a disaster. Um, if anything, he should have at least been better than Donald Trump on this. He wasn't. It seems his entire plan is to rely on the vaccine that was created under Trump. That's about it. On the economy, we have historic inflation. We have stagnation. Uh, things are looking horrible when it comes to the economy. We can get more to that. We have a border crisis. Uh, we have supply chain issues and energy problems. Um, so much so. And even if you're progressive and you're for Green New Deal type stuff, I mean, the guy's begging OPEC to increase the production of fossil fuels after he's basically virtue signaling that we need to end fossil fuels. Last thing is scandals and things like that. Let's not forget he offered that we still don't know who the 10 percent that was going to the big guy, which only makes sense in this context, because it seems really weird that Biden is unwilling to criticize China about COVID. Even if you don't think that COVID came from a lab in China. Remember, one of the first things Biden did was disband Trump's task force, seeing the origins of COVID. Then after public pressure, he actually restarted it, which surprise, surprise, they came to no conclusion within like a month or two afterwards. But he doesn't criticize China for this. Even if China didn't create it in a lab, we know that they lied over and over, which led to the spread happening initially. And yet for some reason, Biden never wants to criticize China for that. Uh, we see that the FBI is targeting parents. We see that they're targeting political opposition. And we see that they're acting as a Gestapo, uh, putting people, political prisoners in jail without their due process rights. Uh, uh, such as some of the people that committed non that didn't commit violence January 6th and the terrible things that are happening there. He's telling people to ignore the courts when the courts ruled against his mandates. He's basically telling them to rule against them. He has dementia. And if I could speak to destiny just for a second, look no further to the things you've been arguing about with the Kyle Rittenhouse and how horrible our media is. Joe Biden led to that by directly calling Kyle Rittenhouse, a white supremacist, he claimed that his reason for running for president was because Donald Trump said Nazis were good people. That's when he decided he was going to run. And so all of this division and lies that you see coming out of the media comes straight from the top, from the Biden presidency. So last thing I'll say is this. The polls don't lie. Uh, we don't have to trust every poll, but it's clear that even a lot of Democrats understand that Biden's been a big disaster. And there's even scuttlebutt inside the party that they might seek someone different in 2024 because they know he's been a disaster. That's it. All right, Destiny. Um, geez, I wrote down talking points, but I guess I don't want my opening statement to just be to respond to every single Rob talking about because I imagine we'll get into that in the back and forth. Um, in terms of the three major things that I kind of wanted to focus on, I think that the coronavirus relief is obviously going to be a big part. I think that Biden had accomplished some historic parts in this coronavirus relief. One of the big focuses is obviously going to be the quasi UBI that he started with the child tax credit. Um, this is the thing that most people talk about, you know, the slashing of childhood poverty, the ensuring of food delivery to a lot of these children as a result of having that money to these families. Um, we can also talk about the unemployment insurance 
insurance, which was a great stimulus to the majority of the American people. I believe the U.S. gave out more stimulus than any country in the world, except maybe Japan, which I thought was really great because the U.S. is historically seen as a country that is unwilling to give stimulus to its people when they're hurting. Uh, the second thing that we'll go into is Afghanistan. I think that Biden was incredibly brave in pulling out of Afghanistan. I think that there are a million reasons why weaker leaders would have stayed um, because they were worried about getting a little bit of egg on their face because that pullout was never going to be clean. I think that given the Doha deal that had already been signed in agreement with Donald Trump, who didn't involve the Afghanistan government in that agreement, uh, I don't think that anything else could have possibly happened with that, but perhaps we'll get into that as well. And then on the third thing, the infrastructure bill, it's the largest infrastructure bill in history that was passed in the United States, over $500 billion authorized in new spending. Rob said earlier that uh, Biden virtue signaled on green energy when this infrastructure bill directly funds a lot of green energy, which I believe is the opposite of virtue signaling. Um, we, there's a million other things we can talk about. The idea of blaming Biden for fighting in Israel and Palestine when Trump was the one that moved the embassy east from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem is laughable. The idea that bombing Syria is a horrible thing when Trump also bombed Syria. Um, the idea that our enemies are emboldened when there was a widespread amount of disrespect for Donald Trump as a leader when he was doing things like photo ops with Kim Jong-un, where his own secretary of state was telling him, yeah, these talks fell apart, nothing happened. Um, if you want to talk about emboldening enemies, I think that Trump obviously won there versus anything else. Um, yeah, uh, but I, could, I don't want to respond to every point in the opening statement. We can just go back and forth on some particular thing if you want. And yeah, I'm good. All right, the floor is open then. All right, if you don't mind, just to set the stage for this debate, I mm -hmm. think the Biden presidency has been terrible. How would you rate it? Would you say it's just okay or it's good? Given the set of circumstances, I would say that Biden, if you would have asked me what he could have accomplished with a 50 person Senate, I would say that he has exceeded my expectation in almost every possible manner by this point in time. I would have never expected it to be as effective as it has been. I wouldn't have thought anything would have gotten done. That would have been my guess. Okay, so, but getting things done doesn't necessarily an indicator of whether or not those things getting done are good, right? So just saying that he's been able to mire through red tape that you thought he wouldn't have been. Like when we look at the actual day-to-day -day lives of Americans, like take the first issue you talked about, COVID. Would you say that Biden's been a success on that issue of COVID? Um, I mean, it's hard to say. I don't know how much... Uh, the president, I, like a lot of this is going to come down to a state by state decision and sometimes even a county by county decision on how they want to manage the coronavirus. Um, in terms of what the president is able to do, um, uh, the mandating all federal workers get vaccinated and have masks, um, the uh, distribution of vaccines to the United States citizens, which I believe are still all completely free. Uh, I mean, like these are good things, but I mean, the president can only reach so much into states when states still have the authority to write their own policy. Okay, so we'll get in. We can start with COVID if you want, uh, but I'll just say in general, I don't know what your stance was, but if I could guess, I would think that you would thought that Trump was terrible on COVID. It's frustrating to me to see a lot of people in our national media and in the Democratic Party that wanted to blame Trump for every death that occurred under COVID with him. They didn't say, well, actually, it was more up to the states and things like that. And then when it's Biden, they're like, well, he can only do so much when we see that there are more deaths under him than there were under Trump. Yeah, so when people say that Trump was terrible on COVID, uh, there is only so much that a president can do, but a president can provide guidance. That's all a president can do. Trump's guidance was first non-existent and then terrible. I would say that Biden's guidance has been good. Um, but I mean, we could conceive of a world where Trump's guidance was better, but there were still deaths. But at that point, I wouldn't be blaming Trump over it. Uh, I mean, we literally had, uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of cases in the U.S. that were still undiagnosed on a formal level. Well, Trump was denying that the coronavirus even existed or that it was even coming or that it wasn't going to be a big deal. Um, to compare Trump's lead up to that over and over and over again and the uh, lackluster uh, pushing of getting, you know, the PPE and everything doled out to what Biden has done, which has been to take it incredibly seriously, I, I mean, I, I would take Biden a million times over. If Biden would have been president instead of Trump, we probably would have been in a better position to absorb this virus than how we have now. What would he have done differently? Um, so recognizing that it existed formally in the beginning probably would have spurred on more American support for things like PPE or like uh, social distancing rather than Trump who continually denied it. And even today when Trump says, hey guys, maybe you should get vaccinated, people are like, nah, fuck no. So I think that that type of like moral or spiritual or leadership guidance would have gotten the American public in general to be in a more receptive state for state governors and then county and city leaders to enact these types of social distancing or uh, other uh, regulations to slow the spread of the virus.
I think I think that this is a cop out for several reasons. One, the idea that it's not the policies and stuff, but it's mere just their guidance, their leadership. That's just bullshit. Secondly, Trump was taking this serious far earlier than even people like Fauci, right? For example, Trump decided we heard Fauci in February on CNN and other places saying, oh, the regular flu is going to be worse. We had prime. We had uh, prominent Democrats, even after Trump started to talk about potential things we'd need to do, saying there's no problem. Go out to Chinatown and hug a Chinese person. The only thing that Biden suggested that would have been different at the onset of covid, which is where you're focusing, is he claimed that Trump banning travel from China was xenophobic. That's what he claimed. So how can you claim that Biden would have taken it more seriously when the very first thing he said that would have been different was, I wouldn't have banned travel from China because I think that has tinges of racism to it. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just writing all this down. So That's all right. yeah, uh, no if problem. we want to jump into each claim, we can dig through these, but almost all of these are either half true or completely false. So firstly, when we say it's not the policies, it's their guidance, that's not a cop-out. Presidents are like, a president can set a legislative agenda. A president can work with politicians to get things passed. And a president can absolutely set the tone. If you want to get into a side argument for can a president influence the beliefs of Americans and what they ought to do and whether or not that becomes down the line instrumental to the types of policies that can pass, I can't imagine that you would seriously argue against that. But I mean, we can have that separate argument if you want. Number one. Number two, Trump was taking this seriously earlier than Fauci. This is just not true. So we can talk about, and, and Republicans have two talking points to go to. It's the, the Chinese travel ban and it's the European travel ban. Both of these were done after the WHO declared you know, a pandemic or declared a problem with China. Trump Trump wasn't ahead on either of these things. If Trump was truly ahead, he would have banned travel from Europe the same day he banned travel from China. He waited over a month to do it. And in that waiting period, we did nothing. We did nothing to get ready. After we banned travel from China, we knew it was becoming a pandemic around the world, and we sat and waited. And then a month and a half later, like, oh, well, time to ban travel from Europe when we aren't even fully testing people in the United States because it took us so long to get tests out in the US that we had no idea that it was spreading to thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I, to say that Trump took it seriously earlier, I mean, like, this is just one of those, this is one of those, I'm trying to find a, a synonym for psychotic. We we can all watch the videos. Um, everybody can go online and Google Trump talking about coronavirus, and we can see when there's like one case, seven cases, like, oh, it's probably gonna go away. Oh, there's not gonna be many. Like, we all watched him say this. I, I don't even know if I'm willing to argue on this point. Everybody can go and watch those videos. Who was videos. saying otherwise? Who was saying otherwise? Was Joe Biden? Was Hillary Clinton? Was Nancy it's, Pelosi? They was weren't Chuck they, they weren't president, and they weren't privy to the same types of information that he was. Okay, number one. Um, okay, and then continuing but on. The question, hold on, hold on, I wait, wait, can, 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 wait, hold on. I'm, I'm trying to get through all of one. So continuing sure. on, we heard Fauci say that the regular flu was going to be worse. Uh, I, I, I don't understand how simultaneously people will attack Fauci for saying it was going to kill millions and then attack Fauci saying it wasn't going to kill anybody. I'm sure that Fauci has updated his views over time. It seems like generally when Fauci is talking about things, they tend to update as more information comes out. I'm sure that I could find something back in like 2004, not to, but like in, in late 2019 or early 2020 where Fauci said something that later ended up not necessarily being true. That's fine. That happens as, as this situation is evolving. Sure. Um, when you talk about how I believe it might have been Pelosi, you didn't say a name, but I think it was Pelosi that said there's no problem. Go out to Chinatown and hug a Chinese person. This was wasn't because they were saying there was no problem, as you disingenuously implied. It was because people like Trump, and then because of his things about calling it the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus, because that happened later on in the United States, we saw a small uptick in hate crimes against Chinese people or Asian people in general, because Americans think all people are Chinese. Um, and then we saw uh, people like not going to Chinese restaurants and stuff because that somehow this this virus was unique to Chinese people. So, and as a response to the uh, the attacks that Chinese Americans had to deal with to their businesses and their persons sometimes. Um, I think that's a totally fine statement. And it's not implying there's no problem. It's just saying the virus doesn't originate from Chinese people. Sorry, two more quick things. You said that claiming that Trump banned travel from China was xenophobic. This is a claim. I think I've heard you even say this before. I always try to look this up. I can never find that. All I find are people saying that say, calling it the Chinese virus or trying to blame Chinese people on this or using that verbiage was problematic. I don't think I could find uh, things where people are like, oh, we should have never banned travel from China. I didn't see that. Or saying we can't ban for travel from China. And then what's further for a further evidence of this, you say if Biden was president or whatever, they wouldn't have done it. The United States just announced a preemptive travel ban on South Africa, plus I think either six or seven other African countries. How can you say they wouldn't have banned travel from, from China or any other country? Okay. Well, based on, uh, oops, sorry, 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 uh, getting a source here. So, uh, 
Here is the tweet. It's from Joe Biden. It was the day that the like a day after the travel ban was announced from China. He said, quote, we're in the midst of a crisis with the coronavirus. We need to lead the way with science, not Donald Trump's record of hysteria, xenophobia and fear mongering. He's the worst possible person to lead our country through a global health emergency. So when Trump was announcing that he was going to do this ban, Biden almost at the exact same time announces that this is hysteria and xenophobia. Notice he uses the word hysteria as well. Now, you eloquently put it out a bunch of things that you think was bad with Trump. Fine. I could argue whether or not that's not the topic, though. The topic is what would Biden have done differently? You're just assuming Biden would have done something differently. When I talk about what prominent Democrats were up to, you really have no defense of that. You're just like, well, Nancy Pelosi did say go hug a Chinese person, but that's because there was an uptick of hate crimes because Trump was blaming this on China. One, that's one thing Trump did better was he blamed China, which we could see that Biden, for some reason, the big guy getting 10 percent is hesitant to ever criticize China for COVID when we know that even if you don't think it came from a lab in China, that certainly China's lies, we now know that they knew that it was spread airborne and that it spread person to person months before they suggested it, which could have been a crucial time if that information would have been made available, that places in Europe and the United States could have prevented travel, which would have helped stop a lot of the initial problems that we saw. And yet, the Biden administration doesn't want to criticize them. And instead, what we see from the Democrats is saying, well, that reeks of xenophobia and there were upticks of Chinese American hate crimes. That's terrible. There were upticks in these crimes. A lot of them, though, there were an uptick in these crimes that were occurring even before that. And a lot of them weren't from what we would consider traditional Trump voters. In fact, a lot of Nation of Islam type members, there was a lot of anti-Asian hate crimes that were going on in New York. And it, this wasn't coming from Trump voters necessarily. Secondly, though, the fact that Biden spoke about this potentially being xenophobia, Biden never, no Democrat, you keep saying Trump should have taken this more seriously early. Where were the Democrats doing so? You say Fauci would have changed his mind. And February 15th, 2020, Fauci was going on national TV saying, oh, this isn't going to be a big deal. What did you want Trump to do? You said he had access to better information. If the point person that he's relying on, Dr. Fauci, is going on national television and saying, this isn't a big deal. Look, it was a month later when Trump started issuing these things. So it was a very short turnaround. And to claim, well, that turnaround sent the signal for the whole thing is nonsense. If we want to talk about signaling and like guidance and leadership and that being an important role, again, we don't have any evidence whatsoever that Biden would have done things differently. In fact, we could see once Biden was president, what did he do? He signaled, great, and more people were dead than there were under Trump. So that signaling seems to be very ineffective. And secondly, what what would this let's talk about signaling? We had Biden, Kamala Harris and other prominent Democrats that seemed to cast doubt on the very vaccine that they're now saying. Oh, and I know that people say, oh, they were saying they didn't trust it because they assumed Trump would monkey with it. And he would be involved in the FDA. Oh, you mean like Biden was involved in the FDA and two people from the head of the FDA were forced to resign because they didn't agree with Biden's pressure on them when it came to booster shots? So the idea, like, I keep hearing that if Biden would have been there, things would have been different. You've prevented no, presented no evidence. I've yet to see anyone present evidence. And the proof is in the pudding. What has Biden done? What's Biden's strategy to COVID? Like, you say the president can only do so much. That's not true. There are things that both Biden and Trump didn't do that are disastrous. For example, one of the big things that the United States hasn't done is increased rapid and free testing to almost every person. Why haven't we invested... We have all of these emergency bills and decisions. Neither Trump nor Biden correctly invested that in saying, if we could get tests in the hands of people, we could drastically diminish the amount of people that are spreading this virus because they'd be able to test at home. And yet they didn't do. And there's plenty of other things like that that we could see. So the idea that it's just, well, providing guidance. And what exactly was the guidance? They, they malign, after they maligned the vaccine, then they said, oh, we're all in on the vaccine. That's our only strategy. Plus we think masks, which there's not proof does much are good. And then, by, and then Biden, he issued Use this mask mandate, you know, for federal property. And what's the first thing he does? He goes out to the Capitol building, or maybe it was the Lincoln Memorial, and he takes a picture with his family violating his own order, which we've seen Biden and Democrats and even Republicans do over and over again. So the guidance has been shit all around, and none of the policies that Biden has issued have been any better than anything Trump did. In fact, you could argue that Biden is significantly worse because when he came into office, he should have had a plan. He already had the vaccines that he's relied so heavily on, and yet he's still been an abysmal failure. Okay, so I, I can't, when you ask me for like proof that Biden could have done better, 
you're 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 essentially conceding that Trump was about as bad as you could have been as a president, and then you're telling me to give you like a historical counterfactual of, of Biden. To, I can't do that. I can't give you a world where Biden was president. Um, I mean, I can look at how Biden handled things as he came into office. I can look at the difference between how he's treated it publicly, which is very serious, versus Trump, who treated it as a fucking joke publicly, while behind the scenes admitting to people, it was in Woodward's book, that he said that it was very serious. You talk about how China could have released this information earlier. Trump knew in February that it was airborne. He knew that it was a serious thing and he continued to downplay it publicly because he was more worried about his political image than the actual safety of fellow American citizens. Um, I can't sit here and say like, well, if Biden was president, would have done this. I don't know what Biden necessarily would have done as president, but I feel like Democrats in general were taking this more seriously from the start than the Republican side of things seem to have been. And I mean, we can see that how it's, that's played out in terms of Republican lawmakers that have gotten sick with the coronavirus versus Democratic ones. We can see this in terms of voters and how they've responded to the situation. You know, you keep saying like, uh, oh, Democrats attacked the uh, the coronavirus vaccine. You know, they attacked it. Who's the one not getting vaccinated today? Are you telling me that Republicans uh, ignore Democrats in every single circumstance, except when it came to the vaccine, they listened to some of the early, very, very, very early, like single statements that some people have might've said about being like, oh, well, I'll wait until the FDA approves it. Like, come on, this is like, um, this is insane. That This is the one thing that Republicans listen to people on. Um, I, if, I, I, so, I thought we were here to talk about Biden's record. If we want, we can go back into Trump's presidency more. Um, but like, again, this is just like one of those things where like we can all watch the videos. We can spend, if you want, we can bring up like videos and timelines of Trump continuing to downplay what's happening. Um, you can blame this on like one or two statements from Fauci. But if you want to make the overall argument that Trump was taking this more seriously than Fauci was, like it's just absolutely not true. Um, Trump is on stage peddling bullshit cures, hydroxychloroquine, which ended up coming out to be harmful and, and not helpful. Um, we, we've got like Fauci cautioning people when it comes to things later on. Now, initially, he might have gotten the mask thing not right, but later on, he encouraged people to wear masks and do the social distancing. You've got Trump encouraging people to get vaccinated, getting booed for it at rallies. Um, th th I mean, I again, we can go back and forth on like Trump's handling of this the entire time, but like, um, yeah, I, I can't tell you like for a fact, 100%, this is what Biden would have done differently because neither of us really know the answer to that question. Um, okay, so yeah. uh, I, I I agree, but I'm saying even one of the big talking points as to why to vote against Trump was because of his handling of COVID. And my question always was, was there going to be a leader that would have handled it better? What would they have hypothetically done differently? And the only, the best, at least you have an argument. Most people don't have an argument. Your argument's like, he would have had guidance. He would have talked differently. I think that would have done nothing. Like you, just a couple of things you mentioned. You mentioned the Woodward book. Dr. Fauci was interviewed after he heard the quotes in the Woodward book. And he said that Trump's comments publicly at the time where he was talking and saying slightly different things to Woodward was in line with what medical advisors were suggesting to Trump what to say publicly, right? So he was basically being told, don't go freak everyone out horribly at the time. Fauci's admitted, who has no reason to lie for Donald Trump, that, yeah, basically he didn't have a problem with the way Trump was talking publicly about COVID at the time, right? Now, you keep talking about, well, what does this have to do with Trump? I agree. The, the problem is this. You're going to say, and this is what I thought would happen in this debate. You're, let me just ask you a question before I continue. Would you say that you thought Trump was a very bad president? I would say in general, yeah, atrocious. Okay. So what's going to happen is, I might disagree with that, but the general thesis of this debate of how is Biden's record, how is he doing, you're going to say, well, better than Trump. But even if that's true and you think Trump was terrible, that doesn't mean Biden's doing good, right? If you say this guy was shit, Trump was shit, and Biden's slightly less shit. So we could look, you keep saying we could look at the record. Sure, we could look at the record of what was being said and things like that. Let's look at Biden's record on COVID. How's that looking? Pretty shitty. That's how well, it's looking. I mean, he Biden, said that he was going to shut. Just he said he was going to shut down the virus and not the economy. That's not true. That's not what happened. We see all kinds of economic misery, which we'll get to when we get there. More people have died. The only thing that he's basically relied on was a vaccine that he had no hand in even giving lip service to creating. In fact, the opposite. He gave lip service to not trusting the vaccine. And we see, although you're technically right that it seems to be Republicans that are least likely to trust the vaccine, even if you think the vaccine is a good thing, let's not forget when it comes to different demographics, we can see a lot of people such as black Americans that are distrusting of the vaccine. I wonder why. Why would predominant Democrat groups like black Americans be distrusting? Could it be because people like Biden and people in his administration have constantly pushed this narrative that it's systemic racism in the U.S. government and the pharmaceutical industry, and I wouldn't trust this vaccine until magically after the election, all of a sudden, now we can trust the vaccine. Now that Biden's here, not only do we trust the vaccine, but we think you should have to take it. 
But the point is, all of this is a moot point. We don't blame the president for what their followers do. Who gives a shit if it's predominantly Trump supporters doing things you don't like? Biden's the president now. The buck stops with him, and he is shit on COVID. End of story. And I would like to hear you convince people why that's not the case. So one of the big promises that Biden made was getting, I believe it was like 100 million Americans vaccinated in the first 100 days of his presidency. Didn't he hit that milestone on like day 60? Like, so I would argue in terms of getting in, in terms of providing whatever necessary federal support was there to get the vaccine out to the United States citizens. He obviously he not only met, but he well exceeded that goal um, in terms of you keep bringing this number up like it's our own over and over again, like the number of people that have died. I mean, like Biden inherited again, a Democrat inherits a shitty uh, situation from a Republican. I, I mean, it's not like he can reverse course on everything at that point. The, the virus is here. It's already in every state and every community. Um, I, I, I don't know what how, how Biden is supposed to just like turn back time on that um in terms of it, there's so many hold on jesus there's like so much like random shit that you bring if you want to like dive into one topic i didn't know that also the coronavirus thing is just one part of the uh, administration sure. and it um it, like the, the difference in, in, in approach here um I, I, I just I, if I'm being honest in the debate, I could lie and try to say, oh, well, if Biden would have come and he would have done. That. I don't know what Biden would have done um, 100 percent as a president, but I'm not here to only compare their, their stance on the coronavirus. I was mainly interested in like major legislative achievements and foreign policy, because it's a little bit easier to compare that on a one to one than a coronavirus pandemic that he walked into as it's going on. And it's already been, in my opinion, botched by the previous leader. But then you're going to say, well, botched how? How could he have done something differently? And I can give you things maybe he would have done differently. But I, do either of us truly know that we're we're both being demagogues at that point? Honestly, we're being honest with ourselves to, to say anything other than that. You don't know if Biden, like, I, it, it's, but the reason why I, I tend to side with the fact that Biden probably would have taken it more seriously is because I think that Biden believed that it was a real issue. The Democrats believe that this is a real bad problem. There were Democrat states like New York that were being severely hampered by it. And it seems like Democrats in general in the United States, the voter base seems to have more aggressive support for measures related to the coronavirus. So that leads me to believe that a Democratic president probably could have handled it uh, a little bit better. It's hard to say, but like when I look at things like say the Ebola scare, when there was some French doctor that was flown back, it seemed like Obama took that seriously. And that was like nothing. Like the idea that Ebola, Ebola was ever gonna spread massively in the United States or in Europe is probably not gonna happen. It's not the type of virus but even that, we, I was hearing uh, Obama take that seriously and was giving public speeches about it, and people seemed to be worried about it. Um, when you talk about like black Americans distrusting, uh, uh, being distrustful of the vaccine, and then you try to pretend that it's because of statements that like Democratic leaders have made, um, black people have a lot of reasons for why they may or may not trust different systems in the United States. I could be totally wrong on this, but I seriously doubt that the average black American is tuning into CNN to get their political discourse for the day. And then they're making decisions on whether or not to trust the medical system based on what they hear on mainstream media news. Uh, it probably has more to do with a history of weird fucky things that have happened to black people in the United States. Tuskegee is brought up pretty often um, as an example. I'm willing to bet that that combined with socioeconomic conditions combined with their already adversarial attitude towards the system that is adversarial towards them is probably going to lead to them to not trust the vaccine or care about it as much as other Americans. I don't know if I'm going to say that I'm going to blame a couple of statements made by Democratic leaders on how African-Americans in the United States feel about the vaccine. That seems a little bit silly to me. Um, and uh, just, yeah, if, if you. Yeah, but uh, we'll so get just off to, COVID. The sure, last okay, thing I want to yeah, say. Yeah, I'm a little nervous on the COVID talk on YouTube. So. <laughs> Oh, shit. Yeah. OK, well, I'll just say this. I'll, I'll just ask uh, uh, one quick question. Then do you think do you acknowledge that Biden and people in his administration seem to cast shade on the vaccine before Biden won? And do you think that that could have caused people hesitancy? I think that there were like one or two statements that I want to say it was Kamala Harris said something about where I don't think they full on said, like, I'm not going to trust it. But it was something like I would it, it was something that was a little bit irresponsible. I was like, you probably shouldn't have said it that way. But like compared to how much Trump has cast out on everything related to the coronavirus stuff, not even remotely close. Yeah, but if the big issue is people getting vaccinated or not vaccinated, that specific thing of casting shade, and it wasn't just Biden, it was certainly a lot of his administration and a lot of health experts that they were routinely touting that said it would be impossible. We wouldn't trust this. And Biden made those claims as well. The last thing I'll say is this. Right? Wait, you um, said Biden made a claim that he wouldn't trust a vaccine? Yeah, Biden Biden said, let me, I'll try to find the actual quote. Uh, let me see what I can find. Uh, give me a second and I'll find it. But yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, shit. Now I'm finding. Let's see if I can find it. But the other thing I want to say as I look for this is you say that um, actually, you know, Biden did a good job getting meeting his goal of a million a day and he may have even surpassed that. But the reality is Biden's claim to get a million a day 
was already being met basically by Trump when he left office. So it's hardly an achievement that Biden came in and just continued Trump's plan. Uh, this is what Biden said in August 6, 2020. The way Trump talks about the vaccine is not particularly rational. He's talking about being ready. He's going to talk about moving it quicker than scientists think it should move. People don't believe he's telling the truth. Therefore, they aren't certain they're going to take the vaccine. And one more thing, if and when vaccines comes, it's not likely to go through all the tests that need to be done and the trials that are needed to be done. Who is this a quote from? Biden. Um, and another quote from Biden, September 20, September 2nd, 2020. Look at what's happened. Enormous pressure put in the CDC not to put the detailed guidelines. The enormous pressure being put on the FDA to say they're going, that the following protocol will in fact reduce. It will have a giant impact on COVID. All these things turn out to not be true. And when a president continues to mislead and lie, when we finally do, God willing, get a vaccine, who's going to take the shot? Who's going to take the shot? You're going to be the first one to say, put me, sign me up. Now they say it's okay. I'm not being facetious. Again, Biden. And there's more if you sure. want. So I, I, okay, I, I think we're probably on the same PolitiFact article. And I see the um, sure. I, I see the first statements that you're that you're not reading. So um, so in terms of what was said on August 6, right, uh, Biden said the way that Trump talks about the vaccine is not particularly rational. He's talking about it being ready. He's going to talk about moving it quicker than the scientists think it should be moved. People don't believe that he's telling the truth. Therefore, they're not at all certain that they're going to take the vaccine. And one more thing, if and when the vaccine comes, it's not likely to go through all the tests that need to be done and the trials that are needed to be done. I think that early on, and I would have to go back and dig through quotes again because I wasn't ready for a coronavirus discussion. But Trump did talk a lot about expediting the vaccine. And it seemed like there was a lot of political pressure from him that he wanted to get the vaccine out as quickly as possible. If that is the case, then I could understand people being a little bit nervous about it. Um, and earlier, uh, Kamala Harris seemed to echo as much um, because the quotes for one of her statements was, if the public health professionals, if Dr. Fauci, if the doctors tell us that we should take it, I'll be the first in line to take it. So it seems like there, there was some acknowledgement there. Now, I would actually go a step farther and say any type of undermining the vaccine is probably not a good thing. But I don't think that these were necessarily like, the vaccine is bad and horrible, but probably more to do with Trump's incredibly obsessive public face of like getting it out as quickly as possible, which I think, I mean, Republicans now are worried about that, right? Um, it's, it's, it's so ironic because when I try to follow down, like, well, who did these arguments end up affecting? If I take you at your word for this and I ignore anything around the quotes, and it seems like Democrats are saying like, man, the vaccine might be rushed, man, the vaccine might be not be safe. It seems like it's all done for political reasons. Who are the people that are making these arguments today? It's not Democrats, it's all Republicans. So the idea that you're saying Democrats made these arguments and they were irresponsible, but the only people that echo these arguments are Republicans, seem like they didn't really hit Democrats or weren't a big part of their messaging early on, because all the people that are acting like this and putting these messages out are Republicans that don't want to get vaccinated. Um, so, There's yeah. very few. There are very few people in leadership in the Republican Party that are suggesting not getting vaccinated. And the other thing is, when you're the only thing you could tout that Biden would do good versus the coronavirus is his guidance, sort of his messaging. And the one issue that he and I would assume you thinks the most important when it comes to vaccine, we can see when it was politically expedient. By the way, Trump was talking about having people be available to have shots by March. That's exactly the timeline that happened. Uh, so, it, but we had all these leaders, including Biden and other medical professionals, saying it would be impossible to develop a vaccine that quick that did more harm even with trump supporters that still tout to that and say yeah even though trump tells me to get the vaccine the reality is we had all these professionals saying it would be unsafe to have a brand new type of vaccine like that to come out so quick and that's one of the big reasons i'm distrusting even the democrats said it yeah but, but the, de but the democrats aren't echoing that right like the, the, these are republican talking points it, it, well you care because the, because your argument is is that democrats caused harm by undermining the vaccine well okay did that actually happen and then when i look at the effect on the public, it doesn't seem that's the case. And when I look at other statements that Biden has made, and I'm sure you see these because it sounds like we're on the same page, Biden literally says, charting a clear path of science-based vaccines free from politics, I get asked the question, if the president announced tomorrow that we have a vaccine, would you take it? And then he says, only if it was completely transparent, that other experts in the country could look at it, and only if we knew all of what went into it. Because so far, nothing he's told us has been true. That seems like a fair statement. I still think maybe you probably shouldn't may have say that. But like when I look at how this has affected the United States population, if we had a ton of Democrats that were refusing to get vaccinated, I would agree with you. It's like, yeah, that you guys fucked up. You caused a lot of harm. But that doesn't seem to be the case. These are problems on Republican side. So I just categorically reject the idea that these are like harmful statements that Democrats made because at the end of the day, it had almost no effect on, on the Democrat public. It doesn't matter if it had effect. You think that Republicans don't look at listen to what the Democrats are saying? No, I don't. Absolutely this. not. I don't think so. Of sure course. they do. Go listen to them. Wait, so is your I mean, argument, I've... I'm just curious on this one. You think that, and I'll even steal it. I won't say this is, is 
ridiculous as it sounds, you think that some parts of the reason why Republicans won't get vaccinated is because of statements Kamala Harris and Joe Biden made about the vaccine? I think it was probably people that were going to be distrusting anyways, but they point as evidence the fact that even Democrats, when it wasn't politically expedient for them, said that there are dangers and it would be impossible to release a vaccine this fast. They point to that and say, see, even they knew. And the reality is, you could say what you want. The guidance was quite simple. We could beat around the bush. We know the truth. What changed when all this, you think all of a sudden Biden was like and Kamala were like, oh, we have better evidence now that the election's over. Now we think that the vaccines are good. No, you know what happened was they knew that COVID was a big weakness for Trump. And so they downplayed him talking about vaccines and that being a potential thing that could help out because they knew that downplaying would help them in the election. They were willing to sacrifice people if it meant helping them in the election. That's what fucking happened. Me and you both know it. So you but think that, from uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm curious something. on a counterfactual than here. You think that if Trump's election would have continued on, do you think that Democrats would have been undermining the vaccine and that Republicans would be running out to get vaccinated and, and the Democratic leadership would say, we don't trust the vaccine? I don't know if it would have been that se severe, but yeah, they would have said that there were decisions being made medically that was being rushed through and Trump was influencing the FDA and other places like that. When in reality, we can see that it's the exact opposite. The only people that we know put pressure on the FDA was the Biden administration, which caused the resignation of two of the top people at the FDA being so furious that they were being rushed to produce uh, it being OK for these boosters. They thought that that was Biden putting pressure on. If you want to keep going COVID, we can't. Wait, I hold on. Which FDA can... resignations are you talking about? Let me find them. You, yeah, it doesn't... Because I know there were some FDA resignations, but I thought this had to do with the types of medications that the FDA was approving, um, specifically over an Alzheimer's drug. I, 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 to no. be clear, hold on, real quick. It's unfair that I'm... I'm like asking you for the specific thing. I don't, I'm not trying to like source you in the middle of the debate, yeah, but I do know that there were some FDA resignations that happened because it had to do with an Alzheimer's drug, I believe that was approved. And the problem that they had was that the Alzheimer's drug didn't show that it was treating Alzheimer's, just that it was treating an underlying condition. I think the accumulation of an, an amyloid plaque, but that didn't necessarily mean that it was in treating the Alzheimer's disease. That was my understanding of it. Um, but there the might've been some other letter. resignations, yeah. Yeah, so this is from Business Insider. It says, in a letter announcing the resignations obtained by the biotech industry publication Endpoints, Dr. Peter Marks, the director of the FDA Center for Biological Evaluation Research, praised the pair for their work during the COVID pandemic. He didn't give a reason for their departure. But sources told Endpoints and Politico that Gruber and Krauss were upset with Biden administration's booster pl shot plan. The administration announced last month that most people would be offered a COVID-19 booster shot about eight months after the vaccination. One former senior FDA leader told Endpoints that Gruber and Krauss were leaving because they felt the Center for Disease Control and Prevention was making vaccine decisions that should have been left to the FDA and were upset with Marx, the leader of their division, for not insisting on the agency's oversight. Okay. All right. Gotcha. So, but okay. So moving on from there, because I do want to get to foreign policy. I think a big thing that we could talk about would be economics though. You mm -hmm. kind of mentioned that you thought that the child relief, the tax credit and things like that. The problem I have is this, like, if you're honest, what did these child tax credits really do? Now there are problems and we can get into the specifics of it, but basically if we're being as generous as possible, you used to get $2,000 for the child tax credit mm -hmm. or what, what, 2000. And now that number is either depending on the age of your child, 3000 or 3,600. Mm -hmm. My contention is when we look at the rate of inflation, that still leaves people in a poorer economic decision today than before when Biden took office. And what? And, well, if you compare it to like just the past year, that's possible because things are like obviously historically fucked when it comes to pricing. But assuming that child tax credit stays forward and assuming our economy recovers and prices stabilize, which they will, um, I don't think you can argue that like an extra a 50 percent increase in your child tax credit has suddenly been nullified by a 50 percent increase in the cost of all goods. It's like the CPI hasn't increased that much. I, I disagree with that. OK, but. Yes, it has. Consumer price index is at a 30-year high. It's at six point, uh, let me get the exact number. This is from October, which is the most recent data we have. Uh, the consumer is 6.2% October to October. That's the largest inflation surge that we've had more than six, 30 years. And in fact, mm -hmm. I believe I read if that trend would continue for seven years, that would mean every seven years, the price of everything would double. Yeah, if, if that it, would continue. That's, if it increases what? that rate for seven years, but like we have worldwide inflation at the moment to try to blame this okay. on some particular thing or to try to say that we expect that to continue at that rate. 
Um, I don't know why, but I guess, well, I do know why, but people always do this when we're experiencing like these historically great or historically horrible economic events. Um, people will say things like, if this happens for five more years, then this will happen. Or I saw people do this with, and it's unrelated to Jeff Bezos, where the Amazon stock uh, jumped a ton like one day and people were like, if this continues for the next year, uh, Jeff Bezos will be worth over a hundred trillion dollars. And I was like, why are we going off of one? Like we're in a historic period in terms of like supply chain crunch, in terms of probably some true inflation. Um, the idea that it's going to continue at this rate for the next seven years is, is a pretty big claim. I don't think any major economist is making. Okay, so that's why I wanted to start with COVID, because again, if we're comparing Biden to the previous administration, because you could say, well, this is a crazy time. The things are different, so it's hard to look at historic things when we're talking about a pandemic that's affecting so many things. Okay, that could be true. So let's look at what the situation was before COVID hit for Trump compared to what we have for Biden if things get rosy and the pandemic goes. Mm -hmm. Even then, we could see that the economy was humming along under Trump. One of the only reasons that Trump, in fact, let's be honest, Trump was not a likable guy to the people that he needed to vote for him uh, obviously his base likes him whatever but he needed independents or people that were sort of in the center to vote for him the only way he was going to get that because of his foibles personality wise was the economy the economy was kicking ass right then covid comes and yet this isn't the benefit of the doubt we give trump we don't say well a historic you know pandemic you can't really blame trump for the economic fallout we say nope the buck stops with him. So given that, you say, well, we're only, this is only uh, inflation for a year. Yep. And that's how long Trump, Biden's been in office. He to, has be, been well, to be clear, I, when I, so if I'm, and I don't believe I said this ever in this debate, and if I've ever said this, wow, this was really stupid of me to say, I, don't, I hope I've never said this, I wouldn't blame the economy during the coronavirus pandemic under Trump as being horrible. I, like, I'm not going to say like, wow, Trump, you really fucked up the economy there. And, Dem and I'll be fair, a lot of Democrats did say stupid shit like that. Like, oh, look at this last year under Trump and the economy. Yeah, no fucking shit. It was a fucking pandemic. Um, the, the economy was humming along under Trump. Um, like you said before, though, um, if we're going to say that like, well, all the shots are being delivered before Biden stepped into office, the the economy was humming along uh, before Trump stepped into office. But I mean, yeah, he relatively didn't fuck with things and he seemed to just let shit go as it did and the economy continued to move, the world economy continued to move. And for the most part, I think it did pretty well. Yeah, for sure, under Trump, for the most part, yeah. Um, but my, my, my chief criticism isn't going to be the economy. My chief criticism is going to be what are the interventions that the president made into the economy? Now, when I take a look at something like, um, the coronavirus relief, or we can get into like the infrastructure bill. And then I compare that to Trump's targeting of like tax cuts. It feels like Biden is taking a more bottom up approach versus Trump taking a more top down approach in terms of their uh, stimulus or their infusion of cash into the economy. And I tend to prefer Biden's approach there to Trump's. Okay, that could be in a hypothetical sense of, you know, what your ideology says is how you want to approach the economy. But the reality is the decisions that Biden made certainly didn't stymie inflation. And all of the plans you're talking about, things like the child credit or the infrastructure bill and all of that. One of the big reasons we have inflation is the massive amount of spending. Now, not all. Let me still man. Not all of this spending was done under Biden. Some was under Trump. Right. But with the lockdown slash spending that we saw, it was one of the largest transfers of wealth that we've seen from poor and working class to the wealthy. Now, I blame Republicans, Trump, but certainly you blame Joe Biden for this as well. And Biden's going on an even more insane spending spree. And what's even crazier is when you're spending trillions of dollars to the tune that Biden is, you would expect that that would stave off short term economic problems. Right. Like if you made me I wouldn't know president. Well, if you made if you were president and you were like, you know what, I'm just going to spend $30 trillion today, that would probably do a lot to buttress people's bank accounts if you divvied it out in a certain way. Oh, well, it sure, but it did. Over... It did, yeah. Well, but, and it's still bad. It did, and it's still bad. That's the point I'm making. What do you and mean, what's bad when you say that? Get... Can you just be a little what... bit more precise? Yeah, when you what... say it's bad. What's bad? Uh-huh. Yeah, like people's like the cost of living for people there, people that were paycheck to paycheck are worse off now. There are people that are having to sell their houses that wouldn't have otherwise. There's people that can't afford to pay rent. This is despite the fact that they're getting all of these extra monies that caused all of this inflation. So it didn't help out in the short term. And in the long term, now we're seeing inflation. So when you say, well, people have an extra 1600 in their pocket. If they have a child, well, there's problems with that. First, that extra 1600 probably doesn't meet the cost of inflation that we've had year over year from last October to this October. So whatever you think about Biden's plans, if we say we give him credit for the child tax credit, why wouldn't we also give him credit for the inflation and the supply crunch and the energy crunch and all of those sorts of things? Um, shit, hold on. I gotta... Fuck, Brittany, why are you fucking with the camera? <laughs> That's all him. 
I paid her off. Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry. So stepping back a little bit, like, um, is there inflation? Yes, there is. Is it because of a lot of stimulus? Uh, I just, I don't think that American stimulus has caused worldwide inflation. I think that there are a lot of reasons, well, not a lot of reasons. I mean, primarily because of things stemming from the coronavirus, there are supply chain crunches that are driving up the cost of a lot of things in the United States and across the entire world right now. Um, the idea that the, the, like, <clears throat> um, sorry. So cost of living is increasing for sure. I don't know what influence the president can wield over that, especially when things related to the cost of living might be like, for instance, like cost of housing or like cost of food, stuff that would show up on the CPI. When all of this stuff is increasing worldwide, I don't know. I, I'm just not entirely sure what the president can do to alleviate that other than giving stimulus to people. Um, we talk about like people living paycheck to paycheck. I don't know how we can say that they were worse off when there were people on unemployment insurance because of the boost that were getting more than they were even getting at their job. Um, I, don't, I don't know which of these people are worse off. Um, and then in terms of people that can't afford to pay rent, rent is increasing in a lot of large cities, but this is a problem that has continued to happen probably for the last 20 years. Um, I, again, uh, I don't know what the president can do to exert influence over housing prices. Prices, unless we're going to say he should take a Bernie plan or AOC plan and go like world or a nationwide rent control or something. Uh, I, I just I don't see these as being areas that the president could inter intervene in. Um, now, as I said before, to start this, I'm not necessarily looking at the president for the economy. I'm looking at the interventions that they make in the economy. If Biden hadn't had done any of these things, hadn't provided any stimulus, the cost of living would still be increasing. People would still be living paycheck to paycheck and rents would still be increasing as well. These have all been trends that have been happening for 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 Jesus, for decades at this point, there would still be a worldwide supply crunch. It's not like people would be better off if there was less stimulus. If anything, there would be even more problems. So in that case, I would consider that to be a positive intervention, even if inflation is happening at the moment. Okay, so, but this would only make sense because you're saying, well, you can't blame Biden for the historic inflation here in the United States because it's happening worldwide, right? So if you say, but we do give credit to Biden because he can't control that inflation for having interventions, but that only works if those numbers worldwide are similar to the United States. And what you can see is from Statista.com, right? You can see inflation 2018, this is year to year inflation rate, 2018, 3.5%, 2019, 3.4%. This is worldwide, by the way. 2020, 3.2%. 2021, 3.5%. So it's around 3% every year. Inflation's up like 0.2% compared to year over end than what we would expect. And yet we have historic 6.8 inflation when it comes to consumer crisis. Uh, so we can see that the policies that Biden's issued, the United States policies have doubled the inflation from what we're seeing on the average in the rest of the world. Wait, also, hold on real quick. When we say average in the rest of the world... I don't care about the average in the rest of the world. I care about the average like the OECD, right? I don't know how much inflation like <laughs> countries in Africa or in, in southern like South America or whatever. I, I don't know what type of inflation or supply chain things. Like I, I, I'm just not as I'd be more concerned with comparisons to other OECD countries because there are countries that are ahead of us inflation in inflation. So like Brazil and Turkey are. But then there are other countries that are like kind of comparable in terms of what the U.S. is experiencing inflation. So I'm seeing like New Zealand, Spain, Poland, Russia, South Korea, Mexico. Now the U.S. is definitely sitting on the higher point of this. But like these are all countries that have experienced a lot of inflation as well. But then if you go down, um, there are some countries that are like experiencing like deflation. Uh, Argentina is a big one. China, Indonesia, India, Costa Rica, the Netherlands, Japan. So if you're going to average all of them out, I don't really know like what that tells us, um, right? I'm looking at a Pew Research article and it says that the U.S. is the eighth highest annual inflation rate um, for the third quarter of 2021. Um, but I, I don't think that we're like doubling the rest of the world. I think that there's a lot of different countries experiencing inflation for worldwide reasons, but they probably experience it a bit in, in different ways. Well, that could be true, right? But even still, the data of the worldwide on the average is going to matter because there are other things that we'd be able to look at. Like, for example, we could say, well, the U.S. has high inflation and so does the U.K. I don't know. I have that data in front of me, right? But even if that was the case, it could be because the U.K. has had very similar policies than Joe Biden, right? And it could be countries that had these more lockdown mandated oriented countries or decisions had higher inflation. That would still be reason to blame Joe Biden for the inflation just because Japan did it and the U.K. did it and Australia did it too. It doesn't matter that the decisions of Joe Biden Biden didn't directly lead to this. Yeah, but I, when I look consumer at consumer inflation. Yeah, go ahead. That's just consumer inflation, right? When we look at producer inflation, it's even worse, right? So producer inflation is at the highest that we've seen year to year, which is 8.6% in October. That ties it for the highest we've ever seen since recorded history. Now, the reality is you could say, well, this was inevitable, but that's not what the Biden administration was telling us. They were telling us inflation, no, it's not going to be that bad. It'll be fine. It's not going to be that bad. Then they said, well, it's temporary. It's just a little bit of temporary inflation. And now they're saying, well, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe 
we need to live more like Europe. Maybe a little inflation is a good thing. And while this is occurring, we can see that large conglomerates and banks like BlackRock are buying up a bunch of real estate that the average person is no longer able to afford. So this sort of stuff, like it, it just it's incredible that like all of a sudden the buck stops here. It doesn't matter when it comes to economic policy. When we can see, regardless of how you put it, the average person in this country by far is worse off economically right now at about a year into Joe Biden's presidency than they were before it. So, That's the truth. Yeah. So when we look at those that list of countries, I, like this is the reason I'm having a hard time saying like stimulus is causing this. So Japan, my understanding is Japan gave more stimulus than any other country in the world. They're experiencing deflation. So it doesn't seem like stimulus alone is explained all the inflation that's happening in the United States. Um, and then we, we keep throwing a lot of other things here. When we say like it's not a bad thing, I don't know any Democratic leaders that are saying that like, oh yeah, 5% inflation, um, quarter after quarter after quarter is okay. I don't think any Democratic leader wants that. Um, but then also again, and you know, we can talk about like the buck stops here or whatever, like inflation is is the purview of the central bank um, or the U.S. Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, I, it, the U.S. Federal Reserve sets its targets. It's hard to tell how much inflation right now is real versus um, transitory, uh, how much it's going to go away. Like it might be the case that we're experiencing massive inflation and it continues to happen and it absolutely is a problem it might be a case that we are super crunched right now in supply lines all over the world and it ends up not being as much of a problem in a year or two or three or maybe the consumption around the world is increasing so much that it will continue to be a problem but i just i don't know if i would say that like in a time when the entire world is experiencing so much uh inflation um and in a time where there were countries that did more stimulus than us like japan who aren't experiencing inflation or experiencing deflation it just seems really hard to say the, the stimulus in the united states is the primary driver of inflation Inflation. I think the most I was able to find, because I was everybody's obviously curious, well, what's causing it? I think I read like a Wall Street Journal article that said that there might have been some small con contribution there, but I don't think any economists are saying like, oh yeah, it was the U.S. stimulus that definitely is causing inflation in the United States. Like it still seems to be that people universally believe that it is a massive supply chain crunch, and hopefully as that resolves itself over time, um, we would expect to see this fall. Okay, but again, I'm not saying it's purely the stimulus. I'm saying it is a it's a conglomerate of all of the decisions that we've seen our leaders, particularly Joe Biden and the Democrats that have been in charge in all of that, you know, House, Senate, and presidency. They own this, right? And when you say like it, it's well, just, like what decisions? Look, what do you mean I, by that? Yeah. Well, there's all sorts, right? Like, for example, decisions that come to energy, right? Stopping and leading guidance to lower the domestic production of fossil fuels, which required us to import more from overseas. There are decisions they made on lockdowns and things like that that helped lead to the supply chain crunch. All of these things, in addition to the mass amounts of spending we're seeing, is what's going to cause inflation. And I think that if you were, like, if you really think about this, right, the idea that you're saying, well, look, we can't take the world average amount of inflation. Right, because they could be that the, some countries are really high and some are really low. Well, but that seems to be a cop out because your entire argument that's kind of saying we don't blame the Biden administration for this inflation is, well, it's like this around the world. Well, that's not true. Now, the world is facing similar problems. They're facing a pandemic. They're facing supply chain crunches and other things like that. And yet they don't have near on average the inflation we see. You cite one country, you say Japan. OK, but maybe Japan had other policies that buttress them more against the sort of inflation that we see with the Biden administration. I don't know how you could look at the United States being so far above average in poor economic performance and say, well, we can't blame Biden for any of that, but we could give him credit for interventions, but we can't look at the rest of the world uh, on average. It, it just doesn't make sense. Like, I guess it, I would the just, Biden administration I, and the Democrats own this. I mean, we can say that, but I, I, I just I don't think anybody agrees with that. I just don't think that's true. If you look at all the countries and you look at how they've doled out stimulus, now, if you want to talk about other policies that could be used to buttress against this type of inflation, then, yeah, we can talk about those potential other policies. But, like, when we look at the amount of stimulus given in different countries, um, so particularly um, there's a thread that I'm familiar with where people are talking about, like, the average budget deficit to, to look at deficit spending during these things, and then you try to draw, like, a line to see how many of these countries experienced inflation. It, there just doesn't seem to be a strong trend there. It seems to be other things that are unrelated to the amount of stimulus or spending that countries did. Um, now, if you want to talk about, again, and I'll say again, if you want to talk about like other policies, that's fine. Um, you mentioned like stopping domestic production of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, it, so my understanding is, I think that they said that we're not allowed to drill on like some federally owned lands, but I don't think the majority of our fracking or the majority of the um, uh, refining or the oil production in the United States happens on those lands. I don't think that that was a huge like driver in, in not, I'm pretty sure we're still like the largest fossil fuel producer, I think, in the world at this point. Um, I don't know if, if halting production on federal lands, if anything, if you wanted to argue, that seems like a virtue signal to me more than anything. Um, kind of like when you talk about doing things for federal prisons, and that's 10% of the prison population. I don't think that was a big deal. Um, when you talk about how lockdowns are leading to 
um, local supply chain crunches. Um, I don't know if the United States has locked down anything. Um, people are still going to work. You you know, people are masking up or getting vaccinated or whatever. But um, I, I don't know if the United States is like uniquely locked down when it comes to our supply chain stuff. It seems like other countries were way more insane about like I, I say insane, but we're way more strict when it came to locking down their production related stuff. So then let's just say hypothetically, then why do you think the United States is doing so much worse than all of these other countries when it comes to our economic standing? Um, oh man, the, um, it, this gets really complicated because I think that the arguments between economists, and I'm not ready for this debate, but the arguments between economists are how do we measure inflation? And I'm sure if you've read about this, you've heard of this, some people will fight over whether or not the CPI versus the PPP um, versus other types of measures or indexes are more appropriate when it comes to measuring inflation. I don't know if going by, because the CPI is generally what people cite, consumer price index, um, but other people will argue that like the types of goods that are included or aren't included aren't as relevant today when they that index was created, so we shouldn't even be using this as an index for inflation. That's one potential. Maybe we don't index it correctly. Maybe there are better ways to do it. A second possible example is the idea that maybe in the United States, maybe shipping things from overseas is a unique problem that the U.S. has that makes it harder for us to get goods. I don't know if shipping overseas is necessarily as big a deal for European countries as it is for the United States. If we're getting stuff from other countries, a lot of it has to be shipped. Obviously not NAFTA or um, whatever the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement should is called, USMCA. Um, obviously not from those two countries, but if we're shipping stuff from China, China, right? Supply line issues related to cost of fuel or like backups in harbors or stuff related to shipping things overseas is probably going to be way more relevant when it comes to backing up U.S. production than it would be for other countries that might be able to use other modes of transportation or get more of their supplies, say, from the European market, which is the largest unified market in the world. I, now, I don't know 100% if that is the case, but I mean, off the top of my head, I could think of some things that would probably be more relevant than U.S. stimulus spending, which Republicans infinitely say is a huge driver of, of inflation that never has been. If spending money, increasing the money supply at the rate that we've been doing this quickly is certainly going to predictably lead to inflation. Just one thing, That's we can move on to the next topic. Yeah, yeah. One thing, like my final point, and this is just something little that I wanted to correct. I don't know if this is true. I wasn't prepared for this, so I just uh, duck, duck, go this. This is the first thing that comes up from the Washington Post. It says 42% of coal, 24% of crude oil, and 13% of natural gas came from public lands in 2017. So the ban on drilling and things like that from public lands seems like it would have a major uh, uh, major glut in our fossil fuel production, which would be one of the reasons that we went from a net exporter to Joe Biden, who supposedly is pushing Green New Deal type stuff, begging OPEC to increase production. We're now again reliant, again, in one short year. We've gone from being a net exporter, which, by the way, was one of the greatest thorns in the side of enemies we have, like Russia, the fact that we got into that market and was the biggest exporter in the world. Now we are someone that's begging foreign producers that we've had all of these problems with to increase production. Um, so, firstly, we're, the, the prohibition was on new drilling. So that doesn't stop our, our current extraction of oil from places in the United States. Um, I don't know how many new drilling sites, uh, I'll be honest, you said that you weren't prepared for this. I'm not necessarily either. I don't know how many new drilling sites were picked out that people really wanted to go into um, in the United States. Uh, in terms of like whether we're like a... Have, have become a net exporter or not net exporter. Like it, just because we export a lot of fossil fuel, um, and I would have to read up on the specifics of this, like we still import fossil fuels as well. Like there's like refinery processes that you do where you might export certain petroleum products. You might import crude oil for different reasons, even if we are a net exporter of other petroleum products. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the idea that... Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I just I don't know what the point of that is. If you're trying to say that like the United States like um, has like ceased production of petroleum, or ha is, has our production even fallen? I believe so. I'm, I'm not going to bullshit you though. I don't have the data in front of me. Uh, but my understanding, if the production hasn't followed, and we went, it just seems to logically make sense. If production has remained consistent, and we went from someone that was net exporting and making a large amount of money doing it, to now we're begging OPEC to increase their production, that doesn't seem to make sense, unless our production's fallen. Uh, or our consumption could be increased, right? Consumption of oil uh, goods all across the entire world has increased as well. Um, it does seem like our production has dipped for sure from 2020 onwards, um, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm not 100% sure like exactly why, I, I can't really say. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. so we might as well, the last thing I had domestically, we could do it real quick, mm -hmm. uh, it's just the crisis at the border. Um, 
it, no matter how you look at this, if you are for more immigrants or not, I think illegal immigration is bad. Uh, if you wanted those illegals to be made legal, there would be a process that Joe Biden would have been able to do to do that. Uh, but because of his disastrous policies and his guidance and what him and the Democrats and his administration suggested, we now have one of the big issues that he said it was a human rights abuse to have kids in cages. At one point, we had four times more kids in cages under the Biden administration, and we're seeing record record border crossings uh, across the southern border every month. Another undisputed disaster from the Biden administration. So when we talk about like record numbers of kids in cages, I, the, the pro, like these are loaded terms. I don't think the problem was like kids in detainment centers. I think the issue was families being separated at the border. That's the thing that was a problem. Uh, now there were times in the past where people were being critical of Biden and said, "Oh, well, look, like you've got more families, you've got more children in and different detainment centers and whatnot." But the the that was a fundamentally different issue than um, with the problem under Trump that people were complaining about, where families were being separated at the border and 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 were essentially yeah that that was the huge problem there. Um, in terms of like I don't I just I just real quick I fundamentally disagree. I do think that they were making that second issue, saying that the separating of families was uniquely bad. Again, it's hard to blame Trump for that because it had to do with the decision that came out of the most liberal district. But regardless, they were obviously also pissed about the fact that there were kids in cages. And the comments of Kamala Harris and Joe Biden talking about kids in cages being a human rights abuse would never happen under our administration. I'm sorry, I don't buy. Oh, we're talking about different types of kids. Fuck these kids. Four times more in cages? Oh, well, screw them. We were talking about different types of kids. No, 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 no. They said kids being detained was horrible. And then the amount that were detained under Biden increased fourfold. Um... Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, like, if if the only critique is that like kids in ca like I, I don't know what kids in cages mean. Like, are we talking about like just children being detained? Uh, because I mean, like, you have to detain people that are trying to cross the border. Uh, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to argue that that's a failure of the Biden administration. Should they just be let in? Should they just be um, turned around? Or should, I, I mean, like, obviously you you have to detain people that are trying to enter the country. I mean, that's that's going to be an unavoidable process of managing the border. I don't know if I would see this as a giant failure on the uh, Biden administration. But we shouldn't use me and your stand. I agree with you, right? The correct answer when people were criticizing Trump with kids in cages is it's very complicated. So the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said you can't detain children with adults, right? Because obviously bad things could happen. And so the implication was, well, what do you do? Just leave the kids go themselves? If a dad comes across a border with a child and you have to detain the father, what are you going to do? Send the child himself? Or are you just not going to detain anyone that comes with a kid? Well, that doesn't seem feasible. So you're thinking through this rationally. That was the answer. But it's not my standard or your standard that matters. It's Biden's standard. It's Kamala Harris's standard. They said it was a human rights abuse and it wouldn't be done under him. And the Democrats and the media went fucking nuts on this issue. They said Trump was an inhuman monster because these kids were caged. And then all of a sudden, once it's the Biden administration and it turns off, signaling to the rest of the world, yeah, if you come here, it's not a crime to cross illegally and you'll get a bunch of free shit. Well, that led to people sending their kids by themselves. What are you going to do? Leave the kids in? No, they have to be detained. But these people, including Biden and Harris, said that it was a human rights abuse. And so it just goes to show that not only one is this a crisis and just the sheer amount of people that are crossing, but second, the same people that Virtue signaled about being so upset about kids in cages, they never gave a shit. They didn't care at all. They just saw it as a political issue to hammer Trump with. They didn't care about the kids. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to necessarily disagree with that in terms of like the average messaging on almost everything related to immigration tends to be really stupid. Um, I don't disagree with you there, but I mean, like there were Democrats critical of Biden's treatment of this, uh, even post um, even post Biden getting into office, I remember that people were complaining about certain uh, centers that children were being held in and that the standards went up to par on them. But even when you looked into those, I'm pretty sure that these centers that the children were moved to were ran by different apartments that had more humane conditions than um, what some of what was photographed at the border under Trump. Now, I mean, we can argue that um, maybe this isn't necessarily Trump's fault or maybe they had good reason to separate, uh, you know, like children from their families. I have a hard time believing this because I'm pretty sure the federal government right now is paying um, restitution to those families that were separated. So it seems hard to believe that it's still happening and they're paying restitution at the same time i guess maybe that's possible it doesn't seem doesn't seem very likely to me um, that that is happening and then in terms of there being more border crossings i mean historically democrats have been a bit nicer when it comes to immigration and i'm pretty sure historically there are more people that are trying to cross the border under um, democrats i think if you look at democrat uh, versus republican uh, uh, candidate or presidencies and then you look at the border crossings they always tend to increase under democratic presidents it's just something that happens but yeah, but I mean, again, even if it happens historically, that's not a reason to say that this is a success for Biden. And again, I understand. I'm trying to 
There are issues that me and Destiny aren't arguing about, like mm -hmm. how much immigration do we want? We're not going to get into that debate. The point I'm trying to make, even if you think we should have more immigration, you should prefer legal immigration. And Biden would have had the opportunity, as we've seen with Obama, to make a lot of executive decisions that would allow certain classifieds of people to be legal immigrants. But instead, we have record illegal immigration. I, so in this case, um, I, OK, sorry, sorry, I've lost the plot, but now I understand. I wouldn't argue that Biden has been successful in immigration. It wasn't the points that I originally brought up. But on the flip side, I don't know if I would argue that Biden has been unsuccessful in immigration. So you bring up a really good point that if he wanted to, Biden could have flexed some executive authority in order to help people that were immigrants. So I think that he's tried to do that by rescinding some of what was um, done to DACA, or at the very least, it's being challenged in the courts. Um, Trump's uh, attempted of revoking some of the protected status to the DACA people. But I mean, something that we saw between Obama and Trump is Obama seemed to be frustrated that he couldn't get, uh, I forget the name of the Immigration Act passed in Congress, so he started to do some things via executive authority, and Trump rolled on and he tried to undo those things via, via executive authority. Uh, I know that a lot of Democrats are attacking Biden for his mentality of working together, but I actually greatly approve of Biden attempting to get more comprehensive legislation passed through Congress rather than trying to do everything by, via executive order because that just doesn't work out. Uh, legislation is much harder to undo. We saw that under the Trump administration, getting rid of the ACA was unsuccessful versus just attacking executive orders with new presidents. So in terms of like, you're saying Biden has the authority to do a bunch of stuff via executive order. Yeah, sure, he could, but why would you do that when your, your whole point as president is saying, like here, I'm here to work together. I'm trying to pass stuff uh, in a bipartisan manner. And I don't want to just flex a bunch of executive authority that can be undone with the next president. I think that's a good thing to do. I don't disagree with you on that. I, in that we should, I think the executive power, both with Trump, with Biden, with Bush, all of them, we have way too much executive power. And I agree mm -hmm. that that's legislative branches are there to legislate. However, the point that I'm trying to make here is regardless, the decisions that Biden has made has led to record illegal immigration crossings that are occurring. And that's a disaster. And it's leading to real harms like sex trafficking trafficking, fentanyl crossing the border, uh, all sorts of things that are benefiting the cartel, including four times more kids in cages. And I'm just trying to make the point that even if you're on the left, because certainly I don't have to sell it to my audience. I don't have to sell it to conservatives. They're like, yeah, can that I, fucking sucks. Yeah, can but I'm I, making the point that even on the left, it sucks. I'm going to ask but, you this question. I have to run and let Melina in real quick. So I'm going to give you a chance yeah, to no, even research it real quick. Yeah. So um, what decision did Biden make or his administration make that led to like increased illegal border crossings? Was this actually like a Biden decision or is it just more people tend to do this when there's a Democratic president office? And then I'll be right back in one second. I'll answer when he comes back. Meanwhile, I could grandstand. Aren't I kicking ass? I'm doing better than that guy that was dressed as corn. I did can't wait to watch this on two times speed. I'm definitely going to do that. <laughs> I can go faster if you want. So I could, like, this yes, is the answer I'm going to give. The problem is that what we see is that there were a bunch of people like Biden and Kamala Harris, and even every Democrat that was on the stage that raised their hand and said they didn't think it should be a crime to cross illegally. When you do that, and in addition, you said that we should give free education and health care to these people, of course you're going to send the signal to the rest of the world that they're going to come to get all these things. So. <laughs> I can't talk fast. I can talk faster if I want. It's, it has to do with that? policy debate. Uh, it's policy debate in college. You have to talk really fast. It's fucking stupid. Well, it I ruined mean, me for life because it makes me talk fast. <laughs> I thought it was like panels that ruin you because you're trying to get in as much that as you too. can while you have your floor. <laughs> That's that's true, too. But um, no, I think it's going to get look. Here's the thing. I like debating someone like Destiny, because even though I think I'm confident in all my positions, like I'm just setting up in these positions, I think, when it comes to covid, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to, um, you know, fuel and supply crisis, I think Biden's been a disaster. Uh, but I like debating someone that's actually intelligent and can push. Back. <sighs> OK, I all right. But I can answer if you like. Yeah, uh, it, it doesn't have to do. So like. You should know the answer to this because you said that on COVID, the important mm -hmm. thing is guidance and things like that. Mm -hmm. And although I have questions on how much that would be true when we're talking about the specific decisions under COVID, certainly a lot of that is the signal to people that are illegally crossing. So, for example, when we saw every Democrat on the debate stage, when they were asked, who think, raise your hand if you think crossing the border should be a criminal offense if you do so illegally, and no one raised their hand. And then we saw people like Biden and a bunch of other Democrats, almost all of them say, we should give health care to these people. We should give education opportunities to these people it's no surprise when they ask these caravans that are coming why are you coming they say biden we thought trump would send us back and we think biden will take us in and so even if he has the policy to say no 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 we can't take you in he signaled to the rest of the world along with the democratic party that we would be willing to accept illegals we don't think it's a crime you'll still be allowed to come in you'll still be given out of these benefits and would me or you blame people for taking that deal of course not so it was the guidance that Biden and the Democratic Party offered. That's why there is historic numbers of people crossing the border. OK. And I think I said as much earlier when I said that under Democratic presidents, there tends to be more. My understanding is there tends to be more border crossings or at least attempted border crossings. Well, that happened. 
But it seems like you have to concede that if the messaging from the administration is going to cause very real on the ground things to happen insofar as illegal border crises are concerned, we must have to make the same concession for Republican leadership and messaging during the coronavirus. Well, but but there were the difference is this, right? Think about it this way. There are ideas of the messaging can do when it comes to the people we're talking about. So you're right that the leadership and the messaging when it comes to individual wearing a mask or individual choosing to get a vaccine. Yes, that messaging and stuff could matter. I argue that the Democrats weren't any better on that until they found it to be politically expedient once they won the election. But nonetheless, I will concede that on that particular issue, you could be right. However, unlike with this illegal immigration stuff with COVID, there are actual policies that could have been done through Biden using executive privilege, or it could have been through him using his position as the executive to force sort of compromises and things like that legislatively, such as increased testing, uh, increased mononucleids, other things like that, that would have been beneficial instead of just saying, oh, we're going with mandates and the vaccine. When it comes to illegal immigration, what we're talking about is why are these people coming? Now, one of the things, and I'm sure you know this, Destiny, that progressives complain about is Biden's sending a lot of people back. He's sending a lot of people back. Mm -hmm. Well, the best thing to do would be to stop the incentive for people to come in the first place. And that's the problem. The messaging led to that incentive and those people are coming. And then it's a horrible situation. Like, I don't listen. I don't I don't want these people to have a shitty time either. But what do you do? Do you just let everyone in? Do you detain everyone? Do you send everyone back? You've made the decision impossible because of the signaling that you did to the rest of the world. That's what Biden did, and that's what the Democrats did when it comes to immigration. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree, but I mean, all they can do is enforce the rules of the border, turn it back or catch them if they try to cr uh, cross illegally. And then I guess hopefully in the future, try to do some sort of comprehensive immigration reform. Um, but I mean, like right now, that's obviously not the, the main ticket on the agenda. I don't know if I would expect Democrats to change their entire messaging because of a few more or because of a substantial increase in, in illegal border crossings um, when it's just not something that can be part of their legislative agenda right now because they don't have the votes for it or they don't have the political capital for it. Um, but I wouldn't okay, write, I, like, when I'm, I'm talking cool about, with... like, wins okay. or losses of the current administration, I don't, I don't think I'm considering, like, immigration here. This has, like, been untouched <laughs> um, at this point. But again, we're, like, year one into the presidency, too. But, yeah. but again, I'm just saying it's a disaster. Like, all of the things we've talked about. When like, we, we say a say disaster, it's like, it's, what do we mean yeah. by disaster? Like, I, I don't think that, like. It's way, wor it's way worse than it has been in a long, long time. Um, okay, I mean, there are more attempted, like, crossings and turned back, but I, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I guess I could see that. I, I don't think that it's, like, a big thing in the average American mind. I don't think it's, like, a huge detriment to the country. It's definitely probably, I'm pretty sure it's worse than it was under Trump, but, but yeah, okay, I, okay. And that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make, that in all the things we've talked about, things are worse now than they were before Biden took office. And you're, you're like, well, we can't really blame Biden for all of that, but... I, Again, I guess we'll leave it to people to decide. I'm cool with moving on to foreign policy if you want. Um, um, talk yeah, about sure. Afghanistan. Yep. Okay, so with Afghanistan, so so you listed three things. The first was sort of COVID relief, which we talked about. Afghanistan was the second thing. Mm -hmm. So on that, right, like you say, it was bold of Biden to pull out. Totally mm -hmm. agree 100%. I applaud Biden for pulling out. I don't have a problem with Biden pulling out. I have a problem with the way that he pulled out. He pulled out like an amateur. We were sold that he was this 47 year politician. He had the chops to do foreign policy. He was a vice president. He was terrible. And he lied to the American people and he lied to the world community and didn't even stay in contact with our allies so much so that he got censured in the UK by parliamentarians and MPs that were furious with the fact that he let them holding the bag as well. What this guy did is this, right? He said that we should close down Bagram Air Base. He told the American people that the troops that we had there and the training that we had from the Afghan security forces would be enough to, um, which by the way, they were two to one outnumbering the Taliban and had superior firepower, etc. He said that they would be able to hold for a long time. And instead what he did was within three days, we were overran. He relied on the Taliban for defense the same Taliban that released ISIS from the prison in Bagram Air Base that then bombed our troops. Every step of the way, Biden's decision on how, not pulling out, but how he pulled out, was a disaster that showed our allies and enemies that we have no idea as a country what we're doing militaristically anymore. So... A lot of this is kind of vague, and I can't really think. When you say we pulled out like an amateur, I mean, we had to get our forces out, and we did that. That was the goal, and that is what we did. I don't know what part of this is like an amateur. Um, you mentioned saying that he believed that the A&I would be able to hold for a long time. I mean, 
of course, he said that. Um, you, you, the president is not going to say, uh, just letting you guys know, a and is fucked. As soon as we leave, that shit is going to collapse. Of course, he's not going to say that in a, in a country that we've been trying to nation build for, what, the better part of two decades? I, I don't see him ever making that statement publicly, regardless of what they thought behind the scenes. I think most people knew that the a and was going to fall to the Taliban. Maybe not in three days. Maybe they thought it would be three months. But like, I don't think there was very much faith left um, in that government to be able to hold its own, regardless of troop numbers, uh, the, 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 for a variety of reasons. Um, I mean, th th we already had an agreement in place with the Doha agreement um, in terms of us having to pull out. And if not, the Taliban would begin to escalate attacks. It's hard to run counterfactuals. But I mean, if we stay longer and the Taliban begins to increase their attacks, like then what? Now, now this is this is why I have so much respect for Biden pulling out the way that he did, despite the fact that it was a little bit messy. Let's say that we run it. Let's say that we say, OK, we're just going to draw down numbers a little bit. Right. Well, let's say that you draw down those numbers and the Taliban that you've negotiated with say, hey, you're not pulling your part of the agreement. Fuck you. And now we start getting attacked. Let's say that we have one bad attack on U.S. troops there. And let's say, hypothetically, 100 U.S. troops die. OK, if that happens, do we know what comes next? Two words. It's a troop surge. Absolutely. fucking you're going to see you're going to see. Uh, you're gonna see Headlines every day, Taliban killing American troops. ISIS is going to be thrown in there because it's all Middle Easterns are the same to the United States. Um, we're going to have another troop surge in Afghanistan, and we're going to be there for another fucking decade. Absolutely. fucking um, It sucks what had to happen, but I truly don't believe there was any other way that the president could have pulled out. We couldn't have done a slow drawdown over time. We couldn't have secretly told people, by the way, we're pulling out, because obviously that would have shown an undermining of, of the ANI. It would have shown that we didn't have any confidence in them, which we probably didn't, but you can't publicly show that. Um, I just... I I don't see there being any other way that we could have left Afghanistan other than to just pull out and say, oh, good luck, sink or swim. No, I, I, I totally disagree. And uh, let me explain why. First, or ANA, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I knew exactly what you meant. I'm not, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not like some of these leftists you debate that will jump on that. I'm not wearing corn today either, will you? Gotcha. Anyways, uh, you said, of course, he said that, right? Well, just to go back to our COVID discussion briefly. Yeah, I don't, I actually defended Biden on that. Right. Of course, you're going to, as the leader, sound optimistic. Same's true of Trump with COVID, which is why when uh, Woodward came out with his quotes, you had Fauci say, actually, the way Trump was talking was in line with what we were advising him to say, because you don't want a leader to come out and say, we're fucked. That's it. This, this, right. So just that just that quick point on there. But when you talk about your hypothetical, first off, I'm not talking about saying like, well, you know, I'm Monday morning quarterbacking and picking out little things. They could have did this and this. It's real simple. You have certain assets in a country. You have our weapons and things like that. You have the people that use those weapons, the military. Their job is to defend in the people that we have there that are American citizens or that are our allies. And then they're to train the security forces, right? You don't bring back the people tasked with defending before the people that need defend it. You don't bring them back before you bring the military equipment back. Bagram Air Base was so much more secure that it would have been the optimal place to evacuate all Americans, all people. I forget what the actual designation is, but maybe you remember what it was. But the people that we considered uh, of special status because they helped our military as translators and things like that. Because it turns out all of these people that we evacuated from Afghanistan, only a very small amount of them were actually the people that allied with us in that way that had that special designation. So the best way to get all those people out would have been to hold Bagram Base, get everyone out, then bring back the military equipment that we could, and then finally bring back the military people. Instead, we did it in the opposite way. And here's your hypothetical. You're like, I concede that if there was a bad attack, that it would have been really bad and it could have led to a troop surge. But that's non-unique anyways, because in order, we had to trust the Taliban. The Biden administration trusted the Taliban in order to get us out. So the Taliban acting is the way they did to say, well, they could have decided to be more insane and just attack us for whatever reason, when in reality, they just wanted us out, seems like nonsense. In fact, discussions with the Taliban that we've now seen showed that the Taliban was totally like, listen, if you want to have control around the airbase there, I forget the name of the city where they were withdrawing from Afghanistan. They said, that's fine. Go ahead. The U.S. could have defense. The U.S. said, no, 
will rely on the Taliban for security, right? So the argument is, yes, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback, but I'm saying something real specific. You don't bring out the defenders before the people you're defending. And the results are evident for everyone to see. We could have pulled out in a similar time frame if we would have kept Bagram Air Base and then pulled out of it last. Instead, we allowed the ISIS troops to be freed. We allowed the most secure air base to be overran. We allowed billions of dollars of technology and weapons to be given to who we are told are bloodthirsty heathens that are going to butcher women and children around the area. Now we've just created one of the largest air forces in the world, and it's bloodthirsty maniacs that we were told we had to fight for 20 years. So in terms of the COVID discussion, I, I wouldn't compare the, the, the reason why I was irritated with Trump's public positions on the coronavirus stuff wasn't because he was trying to not cause a panic or sound good. It was because there wasn't anything being done in the background. If you wanted a totally different discussion on the coronavirus stuff, it actually wouldn't have been Trump saying there's no problem. If Trump was saying, listen, guys, there's no problem. It won't be a deal, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But in the background, they were um, they, they were working hardcore on getting mass testing out, which the United States it's lagged on. They were working hardcore on getting PPE out, making sure that there wasn't a shortage of ventilators, hospital beds, whatever the states needed. If that coordination was happening behind the scenes in a massive level, while Trump was saying publicly, hey guys, you know, it won't be a big deal, blah, 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 blah. I would probably be a little bit warmer to Trump taking that stance. Whether or not Biden is saying there is going to be a, a peaceful pullout and nothing bad will happen or not, isn't really going to make a difference in our, in our pullout. If anything, him doing the other type of messaging and undermining um, the ANA might even look worse on the world stage. But there, it's not like in the background, like Biden could have done something better to improve the way that we pulled out of that country. Um, if you talk about how like, and again, I think a lot of people are, it's a, it's a tough situation to be in. And maybe if we try to play hindsight, maybe we can say there's something different, but I don't even think so. We talk about like bringing back military equipment. Like, what are we supposed to do? Are we telling the NA like, okay, listen guys, we're gonna be honest with you. You guys are dog shit. You're not gonna be able to hold this shit. We're jacking everything. We're taking it all back. Good luck. Imagine if we did that. Well, now Rob Nor would be arguing with Destiny saying, this was a catastrophic failure. Uh, the United States stole all the equipment. We spent 20 years training the ANA. Now we took all of our equipment back. How are they supposed to defend themselves against the Taliban? This was horrible. Now the bloodthirsty Taliban own the entire country because we disarmed the people that were supposed to defend the the the, uh, the Afghanistan government. They can't do it, right? That would have been the, the exact conversation. 100% that we'd be having right now. You have have to leave them with the equipment that they have. You have to leave them with the stuff that we've armed them with. And you, all you can really do is hope for the best. You know, if it's your country, you want to defend it, then good luck. But if you can't, we're not going to sit here and steal everything. Same thing with this idea of like, well, we should have evacuated all the translators, all the visa holders, everybody first. Like, again, you can do that. But like, what does it look like, again, on the world stage or even more specifically to the ANA? We're like, okay, you guys are cool. You got this. All right, guys, you need to get the fuck out of here. We need to get all the visa holders, every, all the SBIs, everybody has to get the fuck. Okay, no, no, no. We, you guys have it. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Get the fuck on the plane because this shit is going to fucking go down in three fucking days got right it's again and i am acknowledging that it sucks and it's shit but this was one of those hard things that had to happen i don't think there was ever going to be a better way that we could have pulled out of afghanistan because every other circumstance involves so many other situations that could go horribly wrong and then on the latter point that you say and i actually have a big issue with this People like to describe the Taliban as insane or bloodthirsty or blah, blah, blah. They're not insane. They have their goals. Sure. When you talk about relying on them for security, we're going to be honest. The Taliban wanted the United States out of there, okay? For whatever we want to say, policy failures, whatever, the United States. The United States kills a lot of motherfuckers. We can go over there and fuck shit up. The Taliban did not want another U.S. troop surge. There is a reason why they didn't take advantage of our hasty retreat to try to blow up Americans or attack people or why ISIS was the one that did it and not the Taliban. Because the Taliban was like, hey, you guys want to leave? Yeah, we'll fucking cover your shit. Get the fuck out. We're actually totally fucking happy for you guys to get the fuck out. I think in that case, the Taliban was probably the best force in the entire fucking planet to secure the U.S. retreat because nobody wanted us out of that country more than the fucking Taliban did. So I don't think that relying on them for security, even if there was a mishap with the ISIS attack, I don't think that was the worst thing in the world. We both have a similar objective there, which is to have the United States pull out of the um, out of the area. In terms of creating the largest air force in the world, um, or not the largest one, but a huge air force with a lot of technology that we left to the Taliban, yeah, you know what? We did it in Iraq with ISIS as well. Um, like, you know, these were wars that were started two decades ago. Like, what the fuck can you do? All I can say is thank fucking God that Biden got out. It sucked and he had to eat shit for it a little bit. I think we, we might have even argued about this before, though. And I think I even said on the political level, this probably won't matter in a few months, even though this was making headlines for like a week. And I think for the most part, I don't think people are going to remember this come election time. We don't talk about it much anymore, but we'll see. So, yeah, it sucked. It was hard. But anybody trying to armchair that it could have gone different ways isn't thinking about 
about like, well, what would that have looked like? What other external situations could that have caused? And I think we got out about as cleanly and, and efficiently as we could have. But see, you contradict yourself because the second point you make there, I'll respond to it first, where you say, well, the Taliban wanted us out so we could rely on them for security. But earlier in your previous answer, you said, well, if we would have took our time longer, what would we have done if the Taliban would have bombed us? Well, the reality is they wouldn't have. They just said, okay, good, just get out of here. If that means you're going to take 30 more days, fine. So, like, I don't understand your previous hypothetical because it seems that we would have known, and by we, I mean the Biden administration would have known, the Taliban wants us out, and as long as we meet some sort of time frame, they're going to say, okay, just get the fuck out. Like, that seems to be buttressed by the fact that we now know that the Taliban was like, how do you want to do this? You guys want to run security? You want us to do it? Like, they weren't, like, being super picky, like, no, we were in charge. Right well, now, we do know that they did free the ISIS prisoners that ended up attacking us. And whether it be through corruption or incompetence, they allowed that attack to occur on U.S. troops. But the bigger point to your first point, and I've heard this argument over and over where it's like, well, you know, what were we supposed to do? Send the signal to the ANA or whatever that, you know, that we were pulling out and then that would have discouraged them. And then so, OK, what would the end consequence of that been? Oh, my God, if we discourage the ANA, the Afghan security forces, whatever they're called, they might have been overwhelmed and say, Three days. Whoops. That's exactly what happened. But we wouldn't but have now. Known and yeah, sorry. But why? But that's on the Biden administration. They should have known. They. It is on the Biden administration that they should have had an accurate assessment, at least very close, at how likely the ANA was to succeed. You even admitted everybody knew they were going to lose. They knew it. The ANA knew it. The president of Afghanistan knew it. Biden knew it. So why would you make the decision to arm the very people that we've been at war at for 20 years? Because you say, well, we don't want to slightly demoralize the ANA. So we have to keep Americans there. We have to close down Bagram Air Base. We can't bring back our allies because we don't want to demoralize the group that we think is going to be fucked in two weeks anyways. That makes no sense. And as bad of a situation it is, is that the Taliban could have overran, say, in two days instead of three days. It's infinitely better than arming them to the teeth in the way we did, than stranding Americans, than stranding our allies, right? So there is a, an easy way. If we wouldn't have get rid, gotten rid of Bagram Air Base, all of this could have been accomplished without any of the negatives. Now, obviously, any random thing could happen. We would have dealt with that if it occurred. But clearly, the best strategy would have been to keep Bagram Air Base, to pull out the people we were defending, to pull out our allies, to pull out our equipment, and then to pull out our troops. That was the order we should have done it. We didn't. And if you say, well, that's just because Biden didn't know. Well, that's on Biden too. That's on Biden and his generals as well then. If they didn't know that the ANA was going to collapse in such a quick time, and so that's why they decided to leave these weapons there and to leave Bagram Air Base, that's on them. So... Okay, so first of all, when you're saying like the Taliban wanted us out in one instance, but wouldn't want us in the other, because yeah, because if we would draw down troops and have some extended presence there, then it is likely that eventually the Taliban would escalate against us because it would be in violation of the agreement that we made to leave. It was part of the Doha agreement was that we were going to leave completely Afghanistan, not that we were going to draw down troops to 2,000, 2,500 soldiers, but that we were going to completely extradite ourselves from that area. So if we try to maintain some extended presence, at some point, the Taliban might be like, okay, well, fuck it. We're going to start bombing you guys, right? We don't know if that would have been the case if we would have done a drawdown, if it would have taken longer, right? Maybe they wouldn't have. Maybe they would have been okay with an extended stay. I don't know why they would have negotiated a prior agreement contradicting that. Um, when you say that we've been at war with them and we don't want to arm them, um, <clears throat> with all due respect to the uh, Afghanistan people, we're not really at war with the Taliban. They do their things over there. You know, them in Pakistan can, can have fun and do their stuff. But the only reason that we have so much um, protracted conflict with the Taliban is because of our presence in Afghanistan. Um, if we leave now, part of the Doha agreement was, now will they honor it? It's hard to say, but part of that agreement was that you are not going to allow these lands to be used to attack. I believe it was uh, the U.S. and I think the Gulf states were specified um, as well. I think that agreement was negotiated in, in Qatar. Um, but th that was part of the agreement is that you're not going to do terrorist attacks or any of that shit against us. Like you you guys. So essentially, it's like you guys stay over here. You do your fuck shit, whatever the fuck. We're going to go over here. We're going to do our shit and we're going to be done. The idea that we're like in this, con you know, this long convoluted war with the Taliban. Technically, hopefully they just want their country back. They get their country back, their country. They take over Afghanistan and then they leave and then we're gone. We're out of there. We shouldn't have any extended conflict conflict with the Taliban. They're not like ISIS who are trying to do shit all over the world and are, are you know, hijacking our weapons to do, you know, whatever. Um, this idea that we would just, I, I, I can't, I, it's hard to even engage seriously. This idea that we would just start taking all of our shit back from the ANA and then loading it up on a plane to be like, you know, good luck. 
I, I mean, like we we just can't do that. Um, yeah, we just we can't do that. It's just that's that's it's it's unthinkable that the entire world would sit and watch the United States completely disarm um, Afghanistan, the Afghanistan National Army, and then just walk away because even if the exact same result would have played out, well, now the United States would have been blamed for it. Now the U.S., now everybody when looking at the U.S., and as I just said before my, my fake rant, everybody say, oh, well, of course the ANA fell to the Taliban army. Like, you guys took all of the weapons from them. Like, yeah. But no one suggested, like, the weapons, for example, a lot of the stuff that was left was equipment that the security forces didn't know how to use, like Apache helicopters and things like that, right? That's the sort of stuff that we left. Like, no one's saying that, like, you take every pistol, every bullet. And keep in mind, they were so far out-armed and outnumbering the Taliban that no one would have looked at it like a slap in the face if we said, sure, we're leaving you with, you know, M16s or whatever the traditional munitions that, you know, we would give to a security force like that is, but we're taking the heavy equipment. No one would have looked at that as like, well, that's it. They're doomed then. They have to leave the Apaches that they don't know how to operate. And the other thing, like, it, it's just real simple. Like, regardless of how we splice it, there are predictable things that we could have done, including keeping Bagram Air Base. You say the Doha agreement. We already failed to meet some of the Doha agreement's deadlines, which was fine. But the problem would be, like, again, we're still saying that Biden had this choice. People were saying, well, what would have happened then is that we would have never fully pulled all troops out. Who's suggesting that? We're looking at Biden's success as a president. Biden could have had a simple plan that said, look, we're going to take 30 days to get everything out. We're going to get the Americans back. We're going to get our allies back. We're going to take the heavy equipment back. And the best way to do that is to keep Bagram Air Base, which the Taliban has basically said, that's fine. You could do that. And then we could have taken, instead of rushing to get out in like two weeks where we couldn't vet people, we could have taken a full month. We could have made sure the people we wanted got out first. We could have made sure that the most expensive equipment got out first. And all I'm saying is we can splice this any way we want. I'm for the pullout. I'm just against how it was done. Yeah, the I just, I guess like it was, I mean, I'm just yeah. real quick. I'll finish. The reality is it was a disaster. Our allies thought it was a disaster and it probably goes a long way to emboldening our enemies like Russia that's now advancing towards the Ukraine and like China that's now advancing towards Taiwan because they think that we're inept because with vast superior arms, with far more soldiers, we got our ass kicked in three days because of the leadership of our military and the Biden administration. I, yeah, I fuck. I just I don't I don't agree with any of this. We're, we're like this emboldening her enemies has been like a talking point for perpetual and infinity wars that we've been doing since the for for how fucking long since fucking Vietnam. Um, this idea that like oh we have to stay, we can't embolden our enemies, we can never retreat, we can never run. Like making the intelligent decision to pull out, which you already said you agreed with, um, is good. The the idea that like a vastly superior army kicked our army's ass. Our army's ass didn't get kicked. We pieced the fuck out. We got out. We left. Our army didn't get their we ass kicked. We left our people. The ANA, we left our people. I, the last I checked, I think there were like two dozen Americans left in Afghanistan. I'm pretty sure every American is out. Um, or basically everyone, like, I don't know if it's possible to get 100% of everything, but everybody that needed to get out essentially got out. Um, in terms of people that were uh, issued special visas or whatever, I don't know what the process is in terms of evacuating those people or if it was possible even to evacuate all of them ahead of time. That seems like it sends mixed signals. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but like the U.S. knew that it was going to withdraw uh, fully uh, like months earlier. I think in July, Biden was saying, we're gone by August 31st. You know, if we would have stayed past that date, you know, I don't know what the Taliban would have done. Again, um, there, there, there were some problems, but for the most part, we got everything out. Uh, we did what we needed to do. Uh, the Taliban aren't relying on our fucking weapons. We sabotaged all of those helicopters before we fucking left. The idea that uh, the Afghanistan people that we left there weren't able to pilot those helicopters, but the Taliban are going to come in, fix them, and be able to successfully pilot them. Like, holy fuck, dude. The Taliban go over to fucking Pakistan and they get all their military shit. Or they're friends with fucking Putin. They get shit from Russia. I don't think they're hurting for arms at the moment. The Taliban are incredibly well-funded and incredibly well-armed. They didn't need to take some fucking scraps that we left for the for the ANA in order to bolster their forces. The Taliban are doing just fine. They were going to do fine whether or not they got any U.S arms um uh, yeah again I, I i think we're talking around this we both agree that leaving was good uh, i take issue with you saying it was a disaster i don't think that there are any other ways that could have happened we can sit here and posit that we could have done a b or c but i think that the potential negative fallout from all of those things could have been horrible I think that a worst case scenario, which was absolutely avoided, and I think even you agree with this, the worst case scenario would have been if we did something and it provoked the Taliban and then we got attacked. And that attack 
uh, instigated a troop surge because the U.S. public wants to see some sort of retribution. So that is the number one scenario that should have been avoided. Everything else is fucking water under the bridge as far as I'm concerned. Um, we're out. We're done. We're not talking about it anymore. I think that's a massive success of the Biden administration. He did what Trump said he would do and didn't do. He did what Obama said he would do and didn't do. Fucking, I, bu fucking Bush probably said we were going to leave Afghanistan. He didn't do it. So props to Biden for it. I think that's a major foreign policy success for him. All right, and I'll just say real quick, the State Department said November 3rd that there are still 400 Americans that are trying to flee that haven't been able to do so. I don't know if they got any of them since November 3rd, but that's the article I read. There's 14,000 people in Afghanistan that still have American citizenship, or um, I don't know if citizenship's the right word, but are allowed to be in America. Um, you know, my point in Afghanistan is real simple. I'm saying that it's this constant, like, sort of warmongering talking point that we're emboldening enemies. I don't think that just withdrawing would embolden our enemies. I think in withdrawing in a feckless way uh, is what emboldens because they're like, holy shit, these people have no strategic ability with their military. I've already outlined specifically the easy steps that we could have taken that anyone with half a brain would have done to ensure that there was less damage that occurred. Just because saying, well, something even worse could have occurred, that's not a reason that Biden did good. But I'm ready to move on to another topic if you want, because I know we only have limited time. Um, um, sure. Uh, you know, uh, I would like to talk a little about the corruption stuff, but I know you mentioned the infrastructure bill. So if, if you want to talk, it's up to you. Uh, we could talk about the infrastructure if you want. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, I mean, this was part of the hopefully step one in a series of bills that will be passed. But I think that the infrastructure bill seemed like it was not going to happen for a long time, but with only 50 Democratic votes, because we can't get any fucking Republicans to do anything. Um, I think that the infrastructure bill that uh, Biden passed has been, is, is awesome. The idea that we were able to get anything passed was really good. Okay, well, the idea, I think that there are a lot of rhinos that are willing to go along to get along, particularly with so much of the pork that we see in the infrastructure bill. Uh, the bill itself is a catastrophe, but you could make this argument against Republicans and Democrats. That, like any time that we're passing bills that are thousands of pages that you know people haven't read before they're voting for is a fucking disaster. And I don't think it's a celebration to be like, well, a bunch of shithead rhinos went along to get along, probably because they were offered pork stuff and things like that. You know, one the one thing I'll say real quick on it, because we don't have all night to talk about it. It seems that the general thesis that Democrats would like about this infrastructure Structure bill. It's sort of that it's helping the average person and it, the cost of it, we keep hearing, it's already paid for, it's already paid for to be the wealthy thing. The salt reductions that occur in this bill are going to massively benefit small millionaires, right? And so places like in California, where traditionally you were able to write off a lot of your taxes federally, if you paid high state taxes, now that's going to be repealed. And this means that you're going to see a lot of millionaires in these places that are actually going to get tax breaks. So the idea that this is only going to benefit fit the poor and it's only going to be the rich paying for it is nonsense and i think that i've already made my point of why it's bad for inflation reasons and a lot of the like the build back better plan that they're trying to link this to the green new deal shit is going to be an absolute disaster that'll make those supply chain and energy issues even worse that we talked about previously so i can't talk to anything about the green new deal so i like um the salt tax is the, the the salt tax cap is a garbage fucking bullshit. I don't understand why anybody would approve of that. Uh, my understanding is that that was basically pushed for under the Trump administration because it would exclusively hurt blue states that have higher state taxes. That salt cap, um, the the uh, like rolling getting rid of that cap, I think was part of the negotiator that had to happen with Cinnamon Man. I think it was it might have been Mansion that pushed for getting rid of that salt cap. Um, I, I think I don't remember, but getting rid of that cap, um, I think the main motivation was because it was something that came in under Trump. But it seems to only punish like blue states. Um, so I think. Getting Getting rid of the salt cap is fine. I don't think that this bill was necessarily sold exclusively as helping like working class Americans. Like it's an infrastructure bill, not a working class American bill. Uh, and in terms of diverting a fuck ton of money to roads, bridges, bridge repair, uh, all of that stuff, I, I think that that's a good thing to do. Um, if we're saying, are you, like, are you claiming that it's not going to flow to any of those things? That none of the infrastructure that it, the money is going to is 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 actually going to go there, or? No, no. I, what, I mean, you don't have to take it from my mouth. Listen to the Democrats' mouth. They're literally claiming everything's infrastructure. I've had debates with people over and over on this. They'll say, well, you know, obviously education's infrastructure because who builds the roads? The people that get educated to build the roads. Those are completely different things. Like when we're talking about specifics. Now, even if you say schools are infrastructure, like the way people are trying to spin this, that everything is infrastructure is horseshit. They're trying to throw in a bunch of language that was similar to the Green New Deal, bringing, injecting race. The roads are racist. The bridges are racist and shit like this. 
this that has to do with their equity mindset that they're trying to achieve that'll be a disaster for the country. But I won't say that there's no money going to bridges and roads. I also won't say that we don't need a significant amount of money going to bridges and roads. That's absolutely true. And that sort of bill would have passed with Republican support. Now, make no mistake, I have no love for the Republican Party. I think many ways at the top, they're shitheads too. But they would have passed a bill that was just like, let's give shitloads of money just to bridges and roads. The problem was all of the extra stuff, which then only got through because all of the pork and stuff that they attached to it. Wait, and what we is can't the... say whether... Oh, sorry. Sure, go ahead. Well, well, you no, you mentioned like education. Quick. I don't think anything... Oh. Uh, like I thought that all of that stuff ended up getting uh, dropped and they're trying to pass right. that with so, the Build America uh, uh, Better. Yeah. Right. So the Build Back Better plan that they said is like a lock and a key that we have to pass this infrastructure and then it will be in tandem with the Build Back Better. Right. Like this is that these are where they're making all of these arguments that everything is infrastructure. Now, I'm not going to bullshit you and tell you I read the entire thousands of pages infrastructure bill. I haven't. Mm -hmm. I've seen some of the stuff that was in there. Some of it I'm not a big fan of. Some of it seems to make sense. We should be spending money on roads and bridges and things like that. The problem I have is how can we determine whether or not this is a success when it's just been passed? So saying that this is a success for the Biden administration, we can see the economic numbers that are already being brought in under the Biden administration that are a fucking disaster as we already went through. So I think it's a bit presumptuous, particularly when we have them just gaslighting people saying it'll cost nothing. Then we heard reports that actually Democrats are worried that when the CBO score comes out, guess what? It turns out they're going to say, actually, it's going to cost a lot and the the bill itself doesn't have the provisions to pay for it all. Now, we'll see what the CBO says, but the gaslighting to people, like pushing this equity message, everything is infrastructure and it's all paid for. It costs zero dollars is bullshit. So uh, in terms of it all being paid for, I mean, I mean um, oh God, I mean, technically everything is paid for, right? The government can print however much money it needs. Um, in terms of like, have we done the necessary tax increases or whatever to get it done yet? Um, I, I don't know if that's happened. I don't think that was part of this bill. I think that's part of the next one that they hope to pass. Um, but in terms of like the infrastructure bill itself, I mean, the vast majority of the spending is on infrastructure. Um, I don't think there was a lot of random pork that got attached to that. And you keep saying Republicans would support it. I don't think Republican, I don't believe there was a single Senate vote by the Republicans on this bill. I think it was completely down party lines. Was it not? Um, I, my, again, I can't talk like we're just because I am ill informed on the actual bill. I can't say that you're right that 99% of the bill is just roads and bridges. My understanding that was from the brief amount that I have read of it, that there was a lot more in it other than that. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're right. Maybe I'll look into it and it's all bridges and roads. Sure. I mean, well, it's not all bridges and roads. Now, I have heard Republicans try to make some claims that it's not infrastructure, um, depending on what you're talking about, but like the vast majority of stuff. So, I mean, I can read the line items, right? So, 110 billion goes to building and repairing bridges and roads. Um, 39 billion goes to modernizing and improving access to public transit. I don't, do you not consider that infrastructure? 66 billion to revitalize passenger and freight rail, including updates in the Northeast Quarter. Like all of this stuff seems to be 42 billion to modernize ports and airports, 50 billion for weatherization, drought protection, and other climate resiliency efforts, um, 65 billion to increase access to reliable high speed internet service. Some people say internet's not infrastructure. I mean, all of it looks like infrastructure to me. Um, you are right. In but the, the devil's the, yeah. often in the details of what that means, where that money's going, as you know, right? Like, <laughs> so you could say it's going to high speed rail, but then it's going to some project that some hypothetical future high-speed rail that never comes through or whatever. I, I, I'm just saying, I understand, like, I don't know what the totality spent was and that all of the, I'm, I'm not fast enough in my head to see if all that adds up to the 1.7 trillion or whatever the bill is and to see what percentages they are, but... Um, but I, I, I will say this, I think at okay. least on the infrastructure bill. Also, to be clear, hold on, I, I'm sorry, I want to be clear on this as well, because I, I actually totally missed the passage of this. Apparently, 13 Republicans did sign on and vote for this in the Senate. Um, so this did pass with bipartisan support. So I don't know, it seems like a really good bill. This is the largest spending bill in the history of the United States in terms of spending on infrastructure. I would consider, I mean, I guess we could conceive of some future where none of the money gets spent or something, which would make it a failure. But I think the passage of this bill uh, in and of itself, I think, is a massive legislative success. Biden has talked over and over again about how he was able to or how he wants to bring other people on board to get something passed and it seems like he's able to do it so i would say that a big legislative su success of the biden administration okay i guess we'll have to wait and see what the bill i mean if the best you can come up with is this bill passed that we have we'll see if it does good or not i you know I don't okay think to be fair i'm trying to defend biden's administration sure, one I year in i can't give you like well like the most he could have passed was a bill like six months ago right like i can't i mean I, yeah that's all i, I got I'm just yeah. making uh -huh. We're both making our case. That's all I'm doing. Okay. You know, the last thing, I don't know how much time we have. So, you know, mm -hmm. the last thing that I wanted to talk about, there's there's a point at the end I really wanted to get to, but mm -hmm. just briefly to mention, because I know we don't have time. Like, what do you think of like the scandal of the FBI being weaponized as basically a political tool to go after parents at meetings and things like that? 
Yeah, I looked into that, and it seemed to be another one of those conspiracy theories that didn't hold any merit. Um, I think that some Republicans were claiming that the FBI was being weaponized to attack parents that oppose CRT. But when I tried to look into like what the school board said about this, it seemed like the problems are that teachers are getting fucking death threats now from parents that think that they're like trying to like turn all their children into you know trans people or something, or or they're trying to force CRT down their their throats. And so I think there were requests being made to the federal government. Are there some like can you look into some of these threats or? Or something, um, or can you provide some sort of uh, federal protection for teachers that are getting these types of threats? Which I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Uh, it's it, it's clearly outrageous. It's far more than that, right? You say it's a conspiracy theorist, but that's often a tool people use when they don't want to look at facts that they're uncomfortable with because they don't have an answer. So let's look at exactly what happened, right? We saw that the National School Board Association recommended using tools like the Patriot Act to go after people that were upset at school board meetings. That NSPA letter, the National School Board Association letter, included about 22 examples that they were talking about. If you click on those examples, because they cited them all in their letter, when you clicked on them, it would be shit like this. It would say, in California, Arkansas, and Pennsylvania, there was problems at school board meetings. And then you click on those links. Problem at the California meeting. They had to shut down a meeting early because people got unruly. Problem in Pennsylvania. People were yelling. That's it. That's the sort of things. And then when you look at the most significant examples, here were some of the most significant. One time, someone made a Nazi salute at one of these school board meetings, mocking the school as being Nazis for their mandates that they had. So it wasn't an actual Nazi. It was someone mocking Nazis, which much like we saw with the people from uh, the McAuliffe campaign or the people in the name of defending McAuliffe that dressed up like, you know, alt-righters, Nazis with tiki torches. The FBI didn't get involved in that for some reason. But anyways, the point I'm trying to make is this. There was only two instances in the National School Board Association letter where they recommended using the Patriot Act to go after parents where they cited actual crimes. One was a situation where it seems like someone harassed and possibly slightly assaulted someone in Illinois. That's bad. Can you real quick, can the you link was, me this thing where they recommended using the Patriot Act? Sure. Yeah. Uh, let me let me find it for you. Where would? Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, no problem. Uh, I would also say, I mean, like, also like as a teacher... Um, if, if I was, if my guess, and I could be wrong is, but my guess is teachers probably aren't used to parents doing Nazi salutes and shit in meetings. Um, uh, and based on the temperature right now in the United States of our political discourse, it wouldn't surprise me if some of them genuinely did feel threatened by parents that were doing that. Um, when you say also that like a meeting is getting unruly, I don't know if that means there's grumbles in the back or if that's teachers and parents like screaming at each other. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. That sounds, I mean, I would have to have more information on that, but. Well, here's here's what we need to know. Like, mm -hmm. regardless, even so, again, the the only other case, uh, does this have the text of the letter? Shit. When you talk about the, the, the text of letter, are you are you talking about this? The Justice.gov, the Justice Department addresses violent threats against school. No, 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 no. That's the memorandum that was sent in response. So, right when you set up the NSBA, set a letter on a Wednesday to. The White House, which we now know was coordinated, whistleblowers told us was coordinated with the White House, and that NSBA letter, which I, it might take me a little while. I'm mm -hmm. I'm slow at like uh, so. I'll get also this to real you by quick. The end of the what night. you're saying that's pretty normal. There's going to be a lot of coordination when stuff like this happens, of course. But go ahead. Well, no, not if you have it. Show me one example ever where we had the FBI collaborate with local law enforcement over people that were just using their constitution. No, no, I'm, your, your statement that the NSBA coordinated with the White House and the DOJ before sending a letter, it wouldn't surprise me if like a large organization of teachers that are publicly uh, employed are going to communicate with the White House in terms of like, what would be the best way to word this or should we send this or that or whatever. Like there's gonna be some level of coordination there. Um, you know, like when people go after, you know, warrants with judges or whatever, there's a lot of coordination there. Like, well, what should we do, right? Like, I, I, that's not a surprise. Like you, you stated that like it was a highly conspiratorial claim where there was like some scheming going on in the background and I don't agree that, that that's all I was Okay, about. well, the reason that I state that is because mm -hmm. then in effect what we have is the White House, the Biden administration, helping craft a letter to give the excuse for the FBI to target parents. A letter that said that they should use tools like the Patriot Act and treat these parents like domestic terrorists. And again, that letter in the examples they gave, they're fucking pathetic, which I'll, I'll get that letter to you. Um, if someone has that letter in the chat, it, it'd be cool uh, that you could post it, but it was the original National School Board Association letter that was sent to the Justice Department, right? Now, they've even even since backtracked that letter, they apologized mm -hmm. for the language that was used in that letter. And yet still Merrick Garland, when he testified in front of Congress, said that the two reasons that he issued his memorandum to have the FBI look into this was one, the National School Board Association letter, 
which, oh, by the way, the other criminal case that they cited mm -hmm. was the gentleman in uh, the county, uh, I forget the name of the specific county, where his daughter was raped in a bathroom, and then he went to the school board meeting to protest the trans laws that were there because his daughter was raped by someone identified as trans in a bathroom, and the school board lied and said, oh, nothing ever happened, we don't have any incidents. And then someone told him to shut up, and he called that person a bitch, and then was arrested. So that's literally one of the two incidents of arrest that the National School Board Association used to suggest that violence was occurring it was because someone was outraged that their daughter was raped and the school board was covering it up. So the school board had to backtrack on that. And yet Merrick Garland says, I used my I used that school board letter, which he couldn't cite one case in that letter of examples of why he did this. And then he said, and I'm quoting now, mm -hmm. he read news stories suggesting violence that had occurred towards teachers and it occurred sure. towards school boards. So like, no, but real, talk just, yeah, just let me finish this point. Real uh -huh. quick. Even if you're for it, right, you should think before we have political opponents being targeted by the FBI, particularly parents, that there should be a damn good reason for it, that the FBI should have a database that's like, wow, we looked into this, we've been looking into this for a month and we found all of these examples. Mm -hmm. Merrick Garland couldn't give one. He just said, I heard about it. I heard about it in the news mm -hmm. in the National School Board Association letter. Then the letters retracted because they're like, yeah, we went too far with this letter. So Wait, the so then the question is, can... so did the FBI actually do anything then? Or are you just upset yeah, about this so... letter? No, no, now we have a whistleblower that actually came out and said, Merrick Garland then lied when he said, well, we're just working with local law enforcement, but we wouldn't use the designation of terrorist or any of the tools that come with that designation in looking into parents. A whistleblower sits came out last week and said, that's exactly what they did. That they, he has information that proves that Merrick Garland's Justice Department and the FBI was looking at these parents as terrorists. They wait, are hold on, wait, 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 hold on. That's not, that's, not, that's not my question. Let's be more clear. So first of all, Merrick okay. Garland, okay, the, the DOJ is separate from... Um, the FBI, right? The FBI operates under its own executive authority and everything, right? Well, but the head of the DOJ, the person mm -hmm. that could direct them is the attorney general. Who sure. Also okay. Heads sure. The DOJ. But so so my, my question though is, so if the FBI investigated somebody, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. My question is, did the FBI actually do anything that was wrong or bad here? Well, they they used investigative surveillance techniques, designated people as terrorists sure. to be allowed to use those techniques. So then, the FBI, well, this, so then to the be clear, then, so what happened is, so what we're, I just want to be clear about what we're complaining about, because we can argue sure. about what we're complaining about is bad, right? Because the original claim sounded like the FBI was like up to no good or was doing horrible things or designating people as terrorists. It sounds like what happened was, is the FBI investigated something, some of which might be domestic terrorist threats. I don't, I don't know um, if, there, if there was one that was improperly investigating, but it sounds like at the end of the day, the FBI did their searches, nothing came up, and then they left it alone. I don't that doesn't sound like a well, bad no, thing. We have no but... evidence that they've ended. The memorandum's still on the books. After the NSBA withdrew their letter, everyone asked Merrick Garland, okay, are you going to withdraw your memorandum? He says no. So they could still be investigating. And the point is this. If we would have, imagine this during the Trump administration. Imagine that Bill Barr comes out and says, we've heard that there are people that protest uh, ICE agencies uh, that have been making threats to ICE agents. And so now we're going to use the FBI based on a letter that says that these people protesting ICE officers are potential terrorists and we need to use the Patriot Act, we're going to use the FBI to coordinate with local law enforcement to look into these groups. You know as well as I do that that would have been found unacceptable. You can't use the FBI to target your political opponents. Yeah, okay, hold on, wait, okay, I'm getting, parents. hold on, I'm getting so confused on this, hold, hold on. The DOJ doesn't direct the FBI around, though. The FBI, doesn't the FBI... The General does. I thought that the FBI answered to the, um... Oh, God, isn't it the director of... Isn't it somebody else in the cabinet? I, I don't think that the DOJ can like tell the FBI, hey, you go do this, you go do that. The FBI operates a independently of the DOJ. Now, they'll report findings no. of investigators of the DOJ, but I don't think Merrick Garland can say, like, hey, you guys go investigate that, or hey, you guys go do that. Like, like, cause That's exactly what he did. It says, well, within the U.S. Department of Justice, the FBI is responsible to the attorney general and reports its findings to the U.S. attorneys across mm -hmm. the country. The yeah, attorney general its... is the boss of the FBI. Okay, I, so then I, I guess so if that is the case, um, okay, that, I don't remember the chain of reporting, but if that is the case though, if, if the FBI, it seems like they haven't charged anybody or done anything wrong. I don't, I don't understand what you're, what, what the claim because is. Because you can't use, you can't use the most powerful investigative and law enforcement agency in the history of the world to target political opponents to investigate them. But right. you, you mentioned right. targeting political opponents, but it sounded like the issue that was being brought up was here are people that were either making threats or acting unruly or whatever in these cases, and then you can investigate those people uh, based on those threats. Are you, are you trying to say that the FBI was being utilized to just investigate all of these people, that investigations were opened up on every single, you say political opponents? I mean, did they check their like party affiliation first? Or I, I haven't seen anything like that at all. Like, 
Well, we know that one of the biggest unions that donates to the Democratic Party is the teachers union. The National School Board Association itself is big supporters of the Democratic Party. And most of these parents that are upset are upset about things that traditionally are considered part of the Democratic platform. Right. And the none idea, of those like, things built and, anywhere towards like answer my question. Is it? Yeah, sure. And so it speaks to those being political opponents. And the point is this. Right. It doesn't matter. Like the. We understand that, that you have a right to privacy, right, that extends beyond to, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, don't worry about it, right? Uh -huh. You understand that. You would never make that argument. So the idea that Merrick Garland used the FBI to look into angry parents, and he couldn't even cite specific examples of like, well, this is why we're doing it. He just said, I heard some things in some news reports and this National School Board Association letter, yeah, but which when you they say, literally yeah, had to so, withdraw the letter and apologize. Let's let's be a little bit more clear on the legal process. When you say look into, that's doing a lot of lifting there, right? I could send an email to the FBI and say like, Rob wants to kill X politician, right? The FBI will look into that, but them looking into it might be like, they review a few videos, they look at my credibility as somebody that sent an anonymous tip, they're like, okay, we're not doing anything, right? Now, another look into could be, um, you know, somebody said that that guy is anti-CRT, and now you start subpoenaing all of his bank records, looking for peripheral crimes or, look, or whatever, you're trying to like take him down that way. That could be looking to, right? So when you say like looking into, I, I, like if the FBI was just reviewing tips, I don't see there being a problem there. Now, if the FBI is starting to like pull and freeze bank accounts and subpoena records and no fly list people, okay, well that seems like it'd be pretty fucked up. But I expect the FBI to look into random tips, even if they come from shitty people like the NBSA or whatever. But or, that's not what's going on NSPA's because not, Merrick yeah. Garland, his memo didn't say we've had some specific allegations that we're looking into. It talked, his memorandum talked specifically about cooperating with local law enforcement to because there was a rash of bad things that were occurring with school, with parents that were angry at school board meetings, right? And so it's saying, like, picture That's this. That's fine. Picture what you just said right there was fine. Cooperating with no, local law not. enforcement. If local law enforcement doesn't have anything bad to report, then I wouldn't expect the FBI to have much to say. But if Why local law enforcement is FBI saying, yeah, go ahead. Why would we want the FBI? Like, let's say you get one death threat, which you probably get more than one, but uh -huh. let's assume you get one. Would we expect the FBI to release a memorandum and say, we contacted Streamer Destiny and he said he got a death threat. And so now we're working with local law enforcement to make sure that all of these people that don't like Destiny, that we're instructing local law enforcement that this is how we need to approach these type of people. It depends on the case. For me personally, no. But if there was some body of people that felt relatively threatened in the United States because issues around their job were becoming highly politicized, and it seemed to be that at least some of these people were saying they felt like they were getting legitimate death threats, it wouldn't surprise me for the federal government to say, like, yeah, the FBI is going to team up with local law enforcement and try to uh, do more investigations if it should warrant it. Because I don't know what powers local law enforcement have when it comes to tracking out this kind of stuff. If you're like in some random, no offense, rural America, but if you're in some random fucking small shit town where your fucking local courthouse uses a fax machine still, right? I don't know what kind of research or investigative tools that these officers have available to them. It wouldn't surprise me they great whatever. But like, I'm not interested in like the, did the FBI say that they were gonna cooperate with local law enforcement? What I'm interested in is, is the FBI like improperly wielding their power or have they been like doing improper things rather than them saying that like, yeah, we'll pledge some resources if something fucked up does happen? Okay, so did, like, I'm not going to convince you, so I'll just put it this way. Trump wins in 2024, right? And he comes out and he says, there are a lot of people online and social media that have been, that community has been vocal, and there's been some threats offered behind the scenes in that. So we're going to use the FBI to cooperate with local law enforcement to go after left-wing streamers, because there's been a lot of threats made from that community. You're fine with that. You say, no problem. Not right-wing streamers, just, just the left-wing streamers. We're okay with that? Okay, you keep inserting that, but you haven't demonstrated that. What do you mean just... The, 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 my understanding is that this isn't a political targeting. Or did uh, did the memorandum or did the DOJ say we're only going after Republicans? We're only going after right-wing people? No, but let's not be naive. We know the people that the, traditionally the political stance of the people that are upset at these school board meetings, that are upset with the school board. We know the traditional leanings of the school board people, of the teachers, and we know the policies that are being, the policies and things that are being acted upon by these parents are left-wing causes that they don't like. Okay, like, sure, but that's, this naive. is substantially, we know what's going on. sure, but this is substantially different than if the president came out and said, we're going after left-wing or right-wing people, that's way different than saying like, we're going to go after everybody that happens to be left-wing or right-wing over a okay. Then thing, fine. But, they say this. Uh -huh. They they merely say there have been a lot of people complaining about Republicans in office. So we're going to have the FBI look into the people that are complaining about Republicans in office. Um, I mean, like the 
be- depending on what it was, sure. I'm, I, I can think of a better example for you that I would absolutely agree with, but maybe I seem like I don't like them anymore because of past things. But like if, if they were to say something like, a lot of people tangential to the BLM organization seem like they've been making threats. We've paired up with local law enforcement and the FBI to investigate or whatever. Yeah, I'd be fine with that. That's okay. Um, we've arguably already done that with right-wing groups r- like related to January 6th. So, I mean, yeah, if you think that there are some domestic terrorists, there's something going on, I don't think there's any problem with, with local or federal law enforcement looking into that. That's fine. But you don't do it with the little amount of proof that they have. Right? We no, heard okay, some again, news stories. it depends on what you do. You keep you using this word, um, look into. And I, like I've said before, this is a huge like space of what does it mean? Look into could mean the FBI gets an email, they look at it, they show it to a few friends, they laugh and they delete it. Or it could mean like, we're gonna start trailing this guy, okay? And we're gonna fucking start pulling bank records and maybe freezing assets and no fly listing this guy because we think he's a threat. So if you if you can point on the other end of that spectrum and say, wow, the FBI has been like doing some crazy shit, all these people, then I'd say, like, well, maybe this is a problem if there was no reason to do it. But if you're just telling me that they've cooperated with local law enforcement and they're looking into these types of threats, that's, that's what I would expect them to do. I don't think that it, to get the FBI involved in such a small level where it, the memo talks about how they're going to work with law enforcement, they're going to prosecute threats and things like that. That's the role of local law enforcement, unless they're being completely overwhelmed or not. But the last thing that I want to talk about, like we're just, can you at least admit that if Trump had done this after groups that we traditionally consider Democrat, such as groups complaining about ICE agents, that the, the, maybe not you, but so many Democrats would have lost their fucking mind and said, Bill Barr is using the FBI to target people that are against Trump. Can you at least admit that? Um, I'm trying to think if this actually happened, if there's like an example. Be- because like, I, I mean, like my, my because, I well, because under Trump, because my position under Trump was generally that it seemed like a lot of these agencies operate far more independently than people seem to think. Like, I don't think that the president can just wield power and direct uh, these these three letters to just do whatever they want. And their in, their independence was definitely tested under um, under Trump. And it seemed to be that they have a, a large degree of independence when it comes to their operations, uh, you know, whether they but answer. But they even said Bill Barr, mm-hmm. even saying that, Democrats overwhelmingly said Bill Barr was his stooge and all these things Bill Barr was doing was to benefit Trump. So I mean, didn't 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 Trump do this to some extent when he directed all of the as much as intelligence as he can to look over voting machines? Didn't Trump say and then didn't Bill Barr? Wasn't he one of the people like, you know, us, I'm looking over what the FBI reported to me and the FBI went over these voting. machines. And I think I feel like when that happened, I was like, okay, fine. If they want to look into it, they can. And they did. And there was nothing there. Um, Didn't Trump direct like all the federal courts? Or no, he didn't direct federal courts, but they were like pushing cases through with voter fraud and shit. And I mean, like, that's his right to do it. If he wants to investigate that stuff, he can. I mean, they didn't find anything, but. Um, but I don't know, taking it regardless. So the last thing I wanted to ask you, because I know we're running out of time is just like, do you think that Joe Biden's personally responsible? And it's, a, do you put this as a, a ding on his record that he said that Kyle Rittenhouse was a white supremacist, right? He put those tweets out there. And I know from past conversations I've had with you, look at how fucking crazy that we have our national media and so many Democrats now of what that's led to. It may have led to this parade murder that we saw in Wakusha. We don't know yet. Because the same media that was calling Kyle Rittenhouse a white supremacist, strangely silent on a black gentleman killing white people who put his hatred of white people and Hitler quotes and things like that in his social media. So I tried to look for this because people claim this. And if he did say that, that was really bad. But I don't think um, Biden ever called Rittenhouse a white supremacist. I think what happened was, is there was some speech he gave where he mentions white supremacy. And then in like the Twitter video, I think there's a picture of Rittenhouse that comes up. Now, I think that's shitty, but I don't think there was ever a time where Biden said Kyle Rittenhouse is a white supremacist. Or if he did, I missed it. Um, And in terms of like Biden's response to everything, I thought he had a great response when he came off the, uh, there was either a plane or he was like walking to a plane or whatever. And people are like, what do you think about the verdict? And he's like, you know, the courts ruled as the courts did. And I thought that was, yeah, that was fine. But he also said that in other ports that he was angry, right? And that's one of the problems with Biden, right? And by Wait, the way, angry about what? Hold on, that's a really vague, what, angry, what do you mean? Well, Biden could be angry about a lot of things. He was angry about but... the decision, about the verdict. I thought he said, my understanding was after, before he knew, he's like, trust the jury process, trust the decision, they made the right decision. What do you mean? Or I'd have to check. Let me see what I can find. Here's the problem. Biden can say two different things on two different days. I mean, every, uh, I mean, depending so on what we're talking about. This is from CNBC. Uh, President Biden said Friday that he and many Americans feel mm-hmm. angry and concerned about the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse. So, okay, so I'm seeing the statement by President Biden, the official one. While the verdict in Kenosha will leave many Americans feeling angry and concerned, myself included, we must acknowledge that the jury has spoken. I think that's fine. Right. But then he says the exact opposite. He says, I'm angry about the acquittal. 
Like, and this is what I'm saying. Yes, someone in Biden's camp wrote him a nice letter and said, here's what you say. But then when he's shooting his mouth off himself, he says, I'm angry about the, and concerned about the acquittal. Wait, hold and on. Wait, wait. That's, the, Bi- that's the exact opposite of what you just said. So when Biden was just running his mouth, Biden said, uh, hey, you know, I trust the jury process. You know, that's what he said when he was coming. Now, this is the official statement that was put on the WhiteHouse.gov, which seems to be a lot more tactfully done. Um, and this is the one that's like, we must acknowledge jury spoken. I know that Americans are feeling angry and concerned, myself included. But like, it seemed like when he was just shooting from the hip, it was just like, oh yeah, the jury spoke. Right. I, no, wait, no, I, I'm getting mixed up then. I thought it was the exact opposite. I thought you're saying the pre-written statement sounds pretty good, but what Biden originally said that he was angry about the acquittal, that was him being asked in person. Regardless, it doesn't matter. Wait, like, okay, hold on. Wait, one of us is mixed. I don't know who. My So the video that I remember seeing was he was walking from the left to the camera and reporters are like, Biden, Biden, what do you think about the whatever? And I think his he said something along the lines of like, um, I you know, I trust in the jury process. The jury has spoken. And then here is a, I don't know where I can link this, but if you just, if you look for, if you Google statement President Biden Kenosha, okay. um, on the website is the, the formal, while the verdict in Kenosha will leave many Americans feeling angry and concerned, myself included. We must acknowledge that the jury has spoken. This oh, okay. Well, yeah then I am confused. That's even worse than. So the official statement is that he's angry about the verdict. And look, I don't buy the writing off of, well, okay, he didn't specifically call Kyle Rittenhouse a white supremacist. He just used the image of Rittenhouse while saying Trump was defending white supremacy. Like, you know this, you know, you've dealt with the insane fucking progressives that, and how insane they are on this issue. Uh-huh. You don't think that this occurring at the top levels, Kamala Harris said something very similar. Uh-huh. She said, yeah, I'm angry about the verdict. You don't think that the sort of gaslighting that started with Joe Biden, who injected race into so much, even saying that the reason he decided to run was because Trump said Nazis could be good people, also a lie. You don't think that that has any influence on the media and on these insane people that you're dealing with on a daily basis now? Yeah, so I disagree with some of Biden's messaging at the top about that. Absolutely. Um, but he didn't call Rittenhouse a white supremacist directly. That's that's what I was contesting. Um, in terms of like, do I agree with the messaging at the top about that? Not necessarily. But I think Biden did a better job than the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party. When Biden was running, he condemned the riots um, explicitly. When other Democrats were seemed a little bit afraid to, he actually was coming out saying that like, we can't have riots. So, so I approve him there. Um, I mean, like, could he be more clear on the white supremacy thing? Um, yeah, probably. But the whole Democratic Party is pretty lost on that road. They'll either come back or lose all their next elections. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I just real quick, just to finish it up. Like, well, we I do think that we're gonna get to too. So. Yeah, yeah. So okay. the, just to finish this point, I'll just say this: like, I think that Joe Biden. A lot of times, the people that are running his campaign want to have their cake and eat it too, and they want to pay lip service and kind of deflect when there's riots that are going certain ways, and they want to inject race and shit when it benefits them, and then when it gets out of hand, and they're like, "Well, we're more moderate. What the fuck are these crazies doing? You created that monster." The media created that monster. The prominent Democrats that are more centrist, they allowed that shit to go in their own party and they created that monster. And that's another reason that I think, you know, message wise that Joe Biden presidency is a failure. I mean, that's maybe, it. but my, you know, my argument has always been both sides. I attack the left a lot for driving the right into a lot of crazy positions. Um, and, and I'll continue to do so because I think that people that get extreme on the left do drive the right into a lot of positions. But on the flip side, I think a lot of people on the right have driven a lot of people to the left into extreme positions as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that go very far left and a lot of things. But I mean, like, that's because people on the right were, were pushing uh, equally crazy as much in the past. Now, we don't hear them as much anymore because so far they're losing the cultural wars. Now, maybe the pendulum will swing in a, in a few years um, or maybe Could next be. year. Um, but like when you got Republicans out here saying shit like, oh, like, you know, trickle down economics. We just need to keep giving more tax cuts to businesses like this is helping America, blah, blah, blah. Um, or when you've got them, you know, saying crazy shit like, you know, uh, we have like the whole everything related to the war on drugs. Um, when you've got everything related to how incarceration is done in the United States. Um, now, I know we can talk about Trump trying to do something with that first step back, but he didn't even fucking fund it when they passed their next budget. Um, and, and Trump is hardly is barely Republican anyway. But like th- like th- there absolutely has been a huge push to the left in terms of them getting pretty crazy on things. But I think a lot of that was driven by a lot of people on the right pushing in that direction as well. And now I agree that there are a lot of people being pushed very extreme right on things and the left is doing that. But I mean, like these, both of these things play into each other t- together. You know, I've been doing like politics now for like five or six years. I understand why things have gone as far left as they have. Um, and now I see why things are going as far right as they have. And yeah, it sucks. But I mean, people are, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. 
Well, I, I'll just say real quick on a lot of these those issues you talk about, I would find myself to be not far right, right? Like prison reform, I think is necessary. War on drugs and stuff, I think stupid largely. So yeah, I get what you're saying, but I think that we see that there is a bigger problem now, uh, and it's more fierce, right? It's more it's more pointed. Like when you're talking about race and calling people, it's one thing to say I'm for tax cuts and like gaslighting people on that. It's another thing to be like that fucking guy's a racist, and you support racist if you support him. That's going to cause more of a vitriolic reaction, and that will make people just... This is why I'm so adamant that we could never accept political violence, because you see these fuckheads on the left, and it's going to drive people to the right that are like, I'm allowed to use violence, because you're a racist, because you're a Nazi, because you don't want trans people to exist. All of which is bullshit 99.9% .9 of the time they say it. But they gym themselves up into such a fury. And to see our president and our vice president kind of go along with this, it's too late. Like it's it, they can't pull the reins in because they already did this shit and they had a chance the other day. The last chance was when they asked Saki, "Would you is Biden willing to step back from those comments he made, uh, kind of pointing to Rittenhouse being a white supremacist?" They said no. They're not going to do it. So I'm sorry. The crazy shit that you're dealing with it goes straight to the top with the Biden administration. Sure, but I mean like. I know why people are as left as they are now. Like, it's not that crazy, you know? We don't hear this rhetoric anymore because we moved into kind of a different era. But Jesus Christ, I remember growing up when I was a staunch fucking Republican, my response to every single fucking thing a Democrat said was, you hate this country. You're not patriotic. You hate the country. You hate the troops. You don't support Iraq. You don't support Afghanistan because you fucking hate the troops. You want our fucking military to die. You want all these people, right? This is the rhetoric that Republicans have been giving for the past, you know, decade or two decades. Jesus Christ. In terms of every single possible Democratic argument. Anytime you say, like, Oh, like maybe we could have more minimum wage. Oh, maybe we can do, uh, you know, maybe more for education. Oh, you want to be like Europe? Because you fucking hate America, right? Well, Jesus Christ, if you tell a group of people for long enough they fucking hate the country, maybe some of them will start to fucking hate the country. If loving America means supporting massive amounts of war, supporting the incarceration of people for fucking smoking marijuana, means not approving of things like gay marriage or any other socially left issue, like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that now we've got a generation of people that are on the left that, yeah, maybe they do say fuck America. Because you've told them for their entire fucking lives that uh, advocating for things like an increase of the fucking minimum wage means you're anti patriotic or saying maybe we shouldn't go to war with all these countries in the Middle East. Oh yeah, well you fucking hate the United States. Okay, well fuck it, I guess they do. Like, I empathize with you a lot because I've been on both sides of it, both in what I believe in and in what I fight against, that rhetoric that is extreme on one side can drive people to the other direction, but it sure. feels like sometimes we have the memory of goldfishes politically that we remember for the past two or three years that uh, 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 Democrats, or at least people on the internet, and even some Democrats will call every motherfucker that disagrees with them, you're racist, you're racist. What's that? You don't believe that we should do this? You're a fucking racist. That's shitty when Democrats say it, and it's horrible, and it does drive people for the right, but god damn, before before that, hearing every fucking Republican say like, oh, you want to, um, you think that gay people should be allowed to marry each other? You hate the family. You hate religion. You hate Christians. You're trying to take away Christmas on Starbucks cups. You want to destroy this fucking country. You want gay people to get married? You're going to be fucking dogs in the street next. Like, holy shit. It happens on all sides. It's not unique to the left. It's been going on. We definitely need to find a way to turn it the fuck down. I don't know where that happens, but I do it sure as fuck know that it doesn't just come from one side. Well, I didn't. I would never claim that it came from one side. And the point is that even when that shit was happening, like, so I'm 37, right? Uh -huh. I remember when that shit was happening. Like, for example, I'm pro free speech. There used to be this asshole lawyer named, I think it was Jack Thompson. He was big <laughs> on the like, video game guy. Grand Theft Auto, yeah. like the, you know, and it's like censorship from the right was has a large history, right? Lenny Bruce, one of my favorite comedians. Who was he being censored by? People that were pro Catholic Church, you uh -huh. know, the comic book code. Where was that censorship coming from? The right. But even back then, there was a lot of cultural pressure that, particularly with younger people, where it was kind of like, no, there was pushback on that in some of our major institutions. But you're right that there was definitely times when the right was worse with a lot of this stuff. The problem is now we see almost every cultural institution institution going the same direction almost every one and it, there's no letting up like the message is just hammered down your throat even more and more and more and the recommendations of what to do and what you're justified to do with people you disagree are worse and worse and worse and what i'm worried about is you're right pendulum swing and when the pendulum swings too far the other way they're all fucking be arguing against that as well but right now in the situation we find ourselves, there is no doubt that the cultural power and the most extreme and vitriolic stuff is coming from the left. It's just true. Maybe it'll be different by the time I'm 60 and I'll fight against mm -hmm. that. I mean, do you still have large people on the right that say things like the election is fake and the, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's That's problems different. on the left. I agree, but I, um, we could go back and forth. We probably are circling the drain and we probably kind of agree. Most yeah, of yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Are we to the Q&A now? All yeah. right. And Guys, I'm really looking forward to watching this back on two um, two times speed. That's gonna be really <laughs> <laughs> especially your little like rap that you did. Uh, uh yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Um, okay, well, 
from JC said, I can't see the join button. I'll try tomorrow. Okay, thank you for the super chat. Um, this one, I think, I believe was asked, but I'm going to still read it from KMX McDonald. Um, he said, for Destiny, when Biden called Rittenhouse a white supremacist, do you think he believed this or is just saying it as a dig by the far left? Um, yeah, so this is something I tried to look for because if he did say it, it's pretty shitty. But I don't, I don't think he called him a white supremacist. I think it was like he was making some general speech, and I think it included critiques of the Charlottesville stuff. But whoever made the Twitter video, no, maybe Biden edits Twitter videos in his free time. I don't think so. Uh, but whoever made the video spliced in images of Rittenhouse and they're talking. I think that's shitty. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, like, I'm probably largely going to disagree with uh, how Democrats talk about Republicans or domestic terrorists. But I mean, like, we've got to acknowledge, like. Biden does his best in terms of trying to work with both sides. Like he literally gets shit on it so much from the Democrats that he's trying to work too much with Republicans. I think we could have gotten, if you if you want to imagine, try not to be too afraid of this, but imagine if we had Kamala Harris as a president, I don't think she would be anywhere near as interested as working with people on the right as Biden is. That might be one of the biggest arguments in terms of Biden not having dementia or Biden being in control of his administration as well, because if Kamala Harris was in charge, again, I think we would see way more adversarial um, remarks and just a general disposition and demeanor towards Republican lawmakers and Republicans in general than we do right now, where Biden does still seem to have a genuine interest in working together with, with Republicans. <clears throat> um. So I wasn't actually finished reading that, but okay. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Ed, being dragged by the far left, is this term just overused by the left too much? Okay. Now, next one from Net7. I think for the super chat. For Destiny, say Afghanistan is um, is water under the bridge. Shame on him. Speaking with members of the Afghan, um, it's not water under the bridge. Okay. No, shit. I think you for the super chat. Wow. Um, from Pepsi101. Why would blacks support a GOP candidate for POTUS after Trump? Be nice to Britney. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't know. Why Is that, that for me? I... I don't know, but he said be nice to Britney, so I'll take it. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, th there's many reasons. Regardless of what you think about Trump's personality and what his personal mindset is, uh, there were a lot of things that were beneficial under Trump with black Americans. Economically, they were doing better than they'd been doing under the Obama administration. And there were a lot of things that a lot of black community leaders really wanted that Trump push for like you know uh funding of historical black universities um the kind of reform on sensing and stuff like that that they push for now destiny's right that ultimately he didn't go as far with that as it seemed that many people would like but this idea that trump was this you know white supremacist that you know he was horrible with black people and he was a really bad one because black people were doing pretty well under him. Um, of course things could always get better but even aside from that i don't think that just because like do you think that Trump is the the stand or the, Trump is the rule or the exception in the GOP. Like if you get Jeb Bush, are you going to say, I'm not going to vote for Jeb Bush because of Donald Trump? Well, Jeb Bush hates Donald Trump. So I don't know how you could impugn future presidents based on that anyways. As a quick in injection in there as well, because people always say black people did really well under Trump. Obama came into the presidency under a massive recession. And unfortunately, one of the huge things affected by this recession was home ownership because this was the housing crisis. A lot of the wealth that was tied up in black families was in housing, and a lot of them never recovered that wealth once they lost access to that housing. Um, and so, I mean, like, yeah, they, they continue to do better under Trump than they had under Obama. That's not surprising, though, given the housing crisis. Um, I will say that Democrats um, hopefully learn this. Uh, I don't know if they're ever fucking going to. Um, th the idea that, like, blacks are a unified group in the United States or browns are a unified group in the United States or yellow people or Asians are all unified. This thinking, it has to fucking go. It is so fucking cringe that a Democrat thinks that every black person, every Asian person, every Hispanic or brown person has the same experience in the United States. You have to do a better job at looking more granularly at these people. It is so unbelievably cringe that Democrats think they can group all together. And the quicker they learn that, the better they'll be doing with those groups of people. Like Biden, he said you're not black if you don't vote for him. Obviously, that was a misspeak. <laughs> okay, so from History Talk, thanks for the super chat, said Rob's notion that must stimulus caused inflation is cringe and boomer pilled. Also, it would have been illegal under international law for the U.S. to randomly seize the weapons of the Afghan military. It wasn't just the weapons of the Afghan military. We left plenty of weapons. Do you think, is anyone here going to claim that the U.S. troops that were there were unarmed? They were unarmed. 
a lot of the weapons that we left there were of the U.S. troops, right? Giving the weapons, weapons that we gave that were beyond the regular munitions that would occur there, taking them back would not have been against international treaties that I'm aware of whatsoever. And as far as, you know, throwing a word, around words like boomer and cringe, <laughs> damn, man, you sound real smart. And uh, when it comes right to it, yeah, if you massively inflate the amount of money we have in circulation, you cause inflation. So if a stimulus the cause to create 1.7 trillion new dollars, what, what's, what are we up to? Since 2020, with Trump and then Biden, of these stimuluses and things like that, what we're over 10 trillion now. You don't think adding that amount of money into circulation is going to cause inflation? I completely stand disagree. down. Are, are you willing? Um, from Dan Zamet. Do you find it right ironic that like Harris that? said she believed Biden sexually abused a woman on Twitter, but then she goes uh, to work for him? And thank you for the super chat. Who was that directed to? Probably I'm, you. Yeah. <laughs> What was, um, what was it? read it again? Fuck. Also, fuck. I shouldn't have ever considered this. I'm sorry. To be clear, that video that Joe Biden tweeted actually had nothing to do with Kyle Rittenhouse. That clip that was shown was while Wallace, Chris Wallace, was asking a question. It wasn't while Biden was talking about white supremacists. Now, this video was tweeted by Joe Biden, but I shouldn't have been considered as much as I did about that. Okay, sorry. What, the question had to do with which woman? So, okay, so do you find it ironic that Harris said she believed Biden sexually abused a woman on Twitter, but then she goes to work for him? Um, I, people say a whole bunch of crazy shit when they're running against each other. If you want to see a fucking bloodbath, um, Obama versus Clinton was insane in terms of like the shit slinging that went on during that election. But I mean, like th there's the memes of like Ted Cruz, um, uh, being accused of his dad being the fucking Zodiac killer and then him phone banking for Trump afterwards. Like, oh, I mean, that's, I mean, that's just, that's how it goes when you're in the primary se uh, season. Like everything is, is, is fair game in terms of attacking people. That's just how it goes. Um, um, I just want to say about this real quick. No, that's completely wrong, right? There's there's fair ground with being like, like you would never accept this in a debate that we're having. Like, and I know because you've defended people that have been accused of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Kamala Harris said that she believed the multiple women that accused Joe Biden of sexual assault or sexual harassment. She said she believed them. And then later she accepted the job with Joe Biden. That means either one, she never believed them. Or second, she does believe them, but doesn't give a shit because it advances her career. That's different than just political gamesmanship. And this goes to show what it shows when someone does something like that is they never gave a fuck about what they initially cared. Kamala Harris doesn't give a shit about sexual assault survivors. If she did, she wouldn't weaponize that and use it for her own political prudence to try to climb up the scale that's what happened it's not just debate is normal yeah i think democrats have really gone too far with the whole me too thing um all right so from jc uh okay i think it's super chat he said rob have you stopped coping over general alden ha huh. uh yeah who was that that said that to me uh jc oh general alden actually called into my show jc and oh, he talked the about that was, like the alden like Thing. No, 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 this guy's okay. real. This guy's real. He looks a lot like General Miley with a must handlebar mustache. But okay. he actually called into my show and he said that actually, yeah, Biden did a really bad job. He said that Vosh sucks. And he also said, JC, that you did a really poor job sucking his balls. Oh, oh man. Okay. Um, um, just in response to that last question, just a quick thing. Um, so apparently when Harris said that she believed the woman who said they felt uncomfortable after Biden touched them, this had to do with Biden like touching people with like the shoulder rubs or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Biden has said his touching was about making human connection, but vowed to be more mindful and respectful. In April 2019, Harris said that she believed the woman who said they felt uncomfortable after Biden touched them. She said, I believe them and I respect them being able to tell their story and having the courage to do it. At that time, none of the allegations including rape or uh, included rape or sexual assault. Has he been accused of rape? Um, by yeah. Reed, uh, yes. And Harris's comments about Reed were that she believes that Reed has a right to tell her oh, story. Reed. Yeah, Tara well, Reed. Oh, well, not like, I mean, like, she was accusing him of, like, mm -hmm. putting his finger or something. Yeah. So, but so I don't think that no, no, Harris no, ever said that she believed we... that, that Bi Harris did not believe that Biden was sexually assaulting women or said that she believed that he had sexually assaulted women. I don't think that was ever said. She, were those women sexually harassed according to the definition of what Harris believed? Um, the accusation so far was um, inappropriate touching, like of kissing of a head at an event or something, stuff like that, or I guess like the hugs or whatever. But it wasn't like groping the breasts or ass or whatever. It was just like the weird touchy shit that Biden does. Right. That's still sexual harassment, correct? Do you think Al Franken it, got wronged? Yeah, of course. Um, but if you want to play that game, we can. But this is clearly not what you were implying earlier that Harris was I believing said the women sexual that assault. Accused uh huh. Sexual assault and sexual harassment, the multiple women. She said she believed them. 
There was no sexual assault or harassment. It was uncomfortable touching, is what they said. Well, that's harassment. Well, according that's to, that's not Kamala sexual harassment. harassment. That's not sexual. Sure, harassment. it is. It's sexual harassment. I'm sure Kamala Harris. It's, if Kamala it's Harris, a personal space, I think. <laughs> a personal space thing, yeah. But like, if somebody like touches your shoulders or something like that, I, I don't know if we can say that's sexual harassment. Mm-hmm. Well, the women were claiming it was sexual harassment, and Kamala said she believed them. She didn't say I believe them, but it's not sexual harassment. So, the story. So, the six other women that came forward to share their stories has unwanted touching. I don't believe that there were any like the Tara Reid story and stuff like that wasn't out. It wasn't that Biden was touching people's like breasts or ass. It was like just his weird hugging shit or whatever. But, I'll have to look into exactly what, what the accusations were and things like that. But I know it seemed like a pretty big deal that when she thought it was politically prudent, she said she believed the women uh, and respected them telling their story that claimed that Joe Biden, sec- they claimed that Joe Biden sexually harassed them. She said she believed, out. what's that? The, all the pictures that people had posted, that's what kind of it was. And people were just like, he was touching my shoulders too much. He was getting too close. Those were the accusations. Inappropriate. That that at the time. Right, that's sexual harassment. That's how the the women weren't saying, uh, I was inappropriately touched. And I, they said inappropriate touching was in the context of these women saying that they felt uncomfortable and were sexually harassed. What the it does, you don't have to doing? touch someone's breast. If you, it doesn't matter, right? What me and you, what us three here think. What matters is what did those women claim? And Kamala Harris, when she thought it was politically expedient, said, I believe them. And then as soon as she got the opportunity to work for a man who she believed was inappropriately touching people, she said, yeah, I don't give a fuck about that anymore. Okay. Um, all right. So from Dan Zamet, thank you for the super chat. Destiny, do you see the hypocrisy in media government on Trump when it comes to Trump's quid pro quo versus Biden's legitimate quid pro quo demanding the termination of the prosecutor looking? I, this is I just I would suggest you literally Google and read two stories about this. You are absolutely delusional if you think these things are even remotely equivalent. If you believe that Biden was the sole reason that prosecutor got terminated, or if he did it for his son, you just you, it's just this is like a basic misaccounting of the facts. Um, I just say. It's funny to me, like, I, it's it's amazing to me. Just because you see someone that lie or do something terrible doesn't mean they're always doing it. But it's amazing to me to see how many people could understand how corrupt our media is in one instance, like with the Rittenhouse thing, that will take them verbatim when it comes to another incident. The reality is, even if people wanted Shokin fired for other reasons, the reason, according to Joe Biden, that he was fired was because the quid pro quo that was issued. We are told to believe that Joe Biden was upset that this prosecutor wasn't looking into his son enough. That's the, do you know any father that would feel that way? If you want to do, I, I, I'll say right now, if if, the, if you guys want to host a debate, I'll do a whole debate on Burisma if you want. Done. To. Do, I, okay. mean, yeah, we can I set that up that. for a couple yes. weeks. Yeah, this is like, that. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Um, all right. So from History Talks, Biden has many flaws, but the MAGA meme of him as a warmonger has been discredited by his foreign policy so far. He is the least hawkish president since Carter. Thank you for the super chat. Really? You think so? In what way? Right? Like he bombed a country, Syria, not because Syria did anything to us, but because Iranians did something who happened to be in Syria. Like that seems to be quite the provocation. In addition to that, he bombed seven children because he had egg on his face because his disastrous policies freed ISIS in Afghanistan. And then he looked weak. So he came out the next day and said, we got him. We got him. ISIS K, we got him. And then only because the corporate media wasn't going to, the legacy media wasn't going to cover this shit. So only because of people on social media that were commenting like, no, these were fucking kids of a translator that worked for the United States. That's the only reason we know. So just because he hasn't got us into a big war, neither did Trump. But we could see, you know, how horrible he's been on a lot of these bombings. Well, okay, so firstly, it, okay, the idea that, like, bombing Syria is totally unjustified. It was Iran and Syria. Iran and Syria are, are close friends. That's that's not that surprising. I don't know why we would say that, like, it's totally inappropriate that uh, Iran is operating in Syria, unless we're assuming that they're doing it covertly and Assad doesn't know, which is probably not the case. Um, it, it, Iran and Syria are incredibly close allies. Um, so, so I don't understand so? that. So it makes I mean, sense that if Syria... with Israel, if Israel does something shitty and then someone retaliates by bombing the United States, would we say, fair enough, we're allies? Of course not. What I'm saying is that, like, if the United States set up a, a, an attack, a missile attack, let's say the United States goes to Israel and, and, you, and from there bombs Egypt, we wouldn't do this, right? And Egypt were to retaliate against Israel, we wouldn't be like, well, why do they retaliate against Israel? It was the U.S. that did it. Yeah, with Israel there guiding the way, of course, right? And any Iranian movements, anything of the Quds Force or anything operating out of fucking Syria is, of course, doing it with Assad's fucking blessing and probably implicit and explicit support. So the idea that we would, like, return fire on, on Syria for that is, is not at all surprising. Um, in terms of, like, Biden bombing children— uh, 
uh, yeah, that sucks. And it was a mishap and it was horrible. But I mean, like we, we can find through every, wasn't there, wasn't there a story of like a family who's, they lost, they lost like their mom and dad under an Obama drone strike. And then under like a fucking Trump drone strike, that son was killed. Like, yeah, it sucks. This shit happens. Um, I, I mean, like it's horrible, but like Jesus, like civilians have been getting killed by uh, US foreign policy for fucking <laughs> probably a fucking hundred years now. It, it, like if not more. Yeah, it, it sucks, but it's not like unique to Biden. Under there. Trump too? Like they stopped um, reporting the civilian deaths. I think that Trump moved to stop uh, to reduce the reporting or stop reporting of a certain type of thing, but I don't remember this off the top of my head. Yeah, I but. believe they, he stopped. They it stopped didn't reporting. happen. <laughs> um, I mean, all right. Whatever. Sorry, go ahead. Um, no, it's well, fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we doing this? <laughs> okay. Um, Ace, uh, thank you for the super chat. And this was when you were giving your um, intro. He said, go off King to Rob. Um, okay. So from Max McDonald. Does Destiny get arguments from the left on why Bernie Sanders would be better than Biden? How do you defend Biden against these attacks? No, I, I don't know what else to say. Bernie lost. He was never going to have the popular support needed. His <laughs> policies are too far left. Like, it's been a struggle under Biden to get stuff passed. There's no way that Bernie would have gotten anything done. Or, uh, you know what, actually, I'll, uh, actually, I'll back that up. I think Bernie could have gotten stuff done, but it would have been far more moderate than what people on the left wanted to do. Because Bernie, like is an intelligent person. And I think he would have known that he needed to moderate his platform a lot to get stuff effectively done. Uh, Bernie is far smarter than the average Bernie bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love that. Okay, <laughs> hear that Bernie bros. Um, LOL, no, thank you for the super chat. He said, Destiny, join post and stream SC2 this week. Um, uh, I, yeah, I got right on that, okay. Oh, hi. Um, and then from Max McDonald, how does Destiny feel Biden could do better for the for the midterms? If Destiny was advising Democrats on the messaging, what could help them in 2022? Good question. Um, there's a lot of parts of the Democratic institution that need to change right now. Uh, it, the best thing that could possibly happen for the Democratic Party is if you guys want to make the Democratic Party stronger, Every single Democrat needs to encourage their Democrat friend to leave their fucking suburb and make at least one conservative friend somewhere else. That you stop saying the most stupid, insane fucking shit. Like, he had a Blue Lives Matter flag, so he's a fucking Nazi. As soon as you say shit like that, you are so fucking out of touch with at least half of the country that your opinion should be entirely disregarded on every fucking thing you talk about. The amount of people that don't have any friends that exist in other places that, like, completely can't understand another person's point of view is destroying our ability to have any time of political conversation holy fucking shit um okay i don't listen to destiny leave the republicans win There's... not really wanting to read this but hank chill said brady was stunning she rocks thank you for the super chat wow okay. you really didn't want to read that one huh <laughs> jeez <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my gosh so um, i think he misspelled rob yeah <laughs> thank you for the super chat. uh all right so from fire rises for Destiny, instead of defending Biden and you made the debate into a Trump versus Biden uh, debate, why do you need to use Trump to make Biden look good? I mean, that's because it's kind of how I, I mean, like, is anybody good in a vacuum? I, I, it's hard to talk about, like, is Biden doing a good job, especially when we start with the coronavirus? Well, a good job is going to be comparing it to Trump. Um, yeah, but I mean, whether or not somebody's doing a good or bad job is usually compared to the other people that have done the job. So that's kind of how we have to do it, right? I don't disagree with that take. Like, you're right. You can't look at it in a vacuum. But one of the points I was trying to make early in the debate is if you think Trump was fucking horrible, saying Biden was a little better isn't necessarily a rousing endorsement of Joe Biden. I mean, Biden's legislative accomplishments are already more impressive than the legislative accomplishments of the entire Trump administration. So, I mean, like, I would say on that end, like, good oh, really? job for Biden. I mean, what are, like, aside from the big tax cut thing, which I, I wouldn't argue is necessarily a positive thing. And if you're complaining about deficits and shit, you probably shouldn't be agreeing with either. Like what, like what major, it doesn't seem like Trump has much to show for his, all of it was done via, as you said earlier, you're glad Biden didn't do it. Most of Trump's accomplishments were done via legislative, uh, not via legislative, via executive action. Stuff related to the border, stuff related to tariffs, stuff related to immigration and travel bans. Um, all of this stuff was done via executive action, which I would argue makes you legislatively unsuccessful. Well, no, there were a lot of budgets and things like that. Bills that were passed. Uh, we had budget uh, crises. Like, I mean, what, like but passing What's the that? budget, that's your, that's your legislative accomplishment is passing a budget. Oh. I mean, was there, of course, right? Because a lot of the same things that are covered in the infrastructure bill were covered in omnibus bills that Trump had passed, no. right? The, so there's like, $550 the billion dollars of new spending that's part of this um, bill that's not that's not related to old stuff. So no, it wasn't just covered by omnibus bills in the past. 
Um, there's plenty of legislative, like I pull up a list if you want. We go through the legislative accomplishments. Uh, and again, you're assuming that this bill that's been passed, the one infrastructure bill that we see is going the largest to be one in U.S. history. Yeah, it maybe it won't be. Yeah. I guess it could be. It might be one of the largest reasons for inflation in U.S. history. All we know is Biden's record right now speaks for itself. Ask people that you have to buy groceries every week or have to fill up their car. How that's going. Hmm. Good times. Is that from like coronavirus or is it from... Um... Every single economist that I've read, every Wall Street Journal article, every Financial Times article I've ever read says that it's supply chain crunches. I haven't seen a single person try to blame, um, try to blame U.S. monetary policy. That 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 I've just I I see like libertarians and abolish the Fed types talk about this, and I've seen people that want to shit on uh, Biden, even though the president doesn't technically he just appointed um, Polygon or whatever. But like the president doesn't directly control monetary policy. I, I haven't seen anybody saying it's because of U.S. stimulus. Um, like I said, I, there was a big Twitter thread on it's it. It's not and just the stimulus. Again, it's again. It, Biden did more than just the stimulus, and we can see that the result of what Biden did made our inflation almost twice as bad as the average around the world. Yeah, average around the world. I think the stimulus was part of that. Okay, that, but that's just not borne out in any other country, and you can't find like a you can't draw like a regressive line or, or, or a regression towards like these did more stimulus and they had more inflation. But like that just doesn't seem to be borne out anywhere. But maybe that's a unique opinion of Rob the Economist. Like I don't see anybody else saying yeah, that. Great, I'm doing so well financially, so people should take that. <laughs> Um, from Dr. Red Pill for both, who do you think would be the best candidate for each party in 2024 and who do you think will get the nomination? Um, Republican, in my, I would like DeSantis, I think. Um, I would say he stands a good shot. Who knows if Trump gets involved, what will happen? Uh, for me, if it was a I Democrat, I think he's gonna run. I don't know, it depends. There's a lot that could happen between 2024. If it was 2022, I think he would run. If it's 2024, we'll see what's happening by then. Um, you know, I, Democrat, I don't know. I don't really know who I'd well, like I'm to see. Well, I'm guessing Destiny would be the one to yeah. um, answer that one. Uh, it has to be Biden again. You can't. The what, idea of really? running somebody against your incumbent is. I, has this happened? I, I actually, I'm ignorant of this. Has this happened? Has this ever happened in U.S. history where you run somebody against an incumbent? For president, but it was like I, mean, I don't think he's gonna run again. Didn't he say he was gonna just do one term? Yeah, he said that initially, but that's so fucking stupid. Oh, apparently, something with LBJ. You think he'll finish his term? I think he'll fit. We can bet on it if you want. Um, but I, I, I'm not. I'm not strong feeling. I'll take about that money. There's a good chance he doesn't. I wouldn't bet money. I'll bet uh, loser 2024. If Biden, mm -hmm. if Biden drops out before then, loser sings a song on the other one's strong. I, 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 I think he'll. I think he'll run again. I mean, it's your incumbent. Like even like with political strategy, he could run again as long as he they can fucking wheel him up on stage to accept the nomination and then die. They would have the uh, vice step in afterwards. Or yeah, like I, I, he'll run again. He absolutely will. He and uh, unless in, in well, your defense. Bar, barring any like major medical thing or him dying in this term, of course. Yeah. But listen, in in the defense of that, I mean, Biden basically didn't do shit for the last two months because he was drugged through the finish line by the. The media as he basically stayed in his basement so yeah i mean they could weekend at bernie's him i guess if both of those candidates were in a high risk category. i mean two, if two of the past like <laughs> fucking 11 months or 10 months or whatever I, I don't remember when the inauguration was has been afk and he still managed more legislative accomplishments than trump there was entire administration i'm okay with that yeah, it seems like, like whatever yeah, he's doing I, right I now seems like it's <laughs> whatever he's doing right now i think it's doing okay so we'll see <laughs> i think most americans disagree with you on biden's <laughs> performance but Right now, um, maybe, yeah. From D. Gulag. Question. Does Destiny think that Biden seems physically, mentally fit, and in control? Um, enough to do the president shit. I mean, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of our government is made up of, like, people that are in their fucking 80s or, or, or late 70s. Um, Jesus, what is Pelosi's age? Isn't she? She's fucking 81 years old. Like, I, we have a lot of old people in our government. I wish they would, you know, try to find younger people, maybe people in their 60s that are still, you know, fresh and able to jog around and stuff. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're all old. I think even, what is Trump 77? Uh, Trump is 75. Yeah, so he'll be 70, like, 8 or 79, 78 maybe when it, when it comes down to running again. Like, damn, these people are old. Like, yeah. <laughs> they are so old. Um, okay, so I think we are caught up. Um, let me just do one last check. Um, yeah, so if you guys want to do closing statements and final thoughts, um, who wants to go first? It don't matter to me. Well, I mean, I would rather go last because why would you want to go first in a closing statement? <laughs> <laughs> what, if, what if my statement's so good you're just like, shit. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> I'll okay. go first, though. Sure. That's fine. Okay. I go first. All right, go ahead, Rob. Okay. Um, yeah, 
So I think we went through, obviously, here's the thing. I think both Destiny and me and Talkers, we could probably go through 100 issues with Biden and give our take on each of them. I think we got to pick some of the ones we thought were important. And I think that I successfully proved that the reality is, despite the fact of wishful thinking and making excuses and saying that Trump could have been worse, this and that, when it comes to things like COVID, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to our foreign policy and things like that, we can see that the reality is things are worse now that Biden's in office than they were previously. And we could say, well, hypothetically, it could have been all of these other reasons, but I just don't think that's good enough. I think the buck stops with Biden. And I was articulate in the ways I thought in each of those categories, why that was the case. And I think that he's been a disaster for all of those things. And I think the average American sees it. And I think that even Democrats see it because there's scuttlebutt within the Democratic Party of whether or not they want Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, or if they want to run Biden in 2024. So he is wildly unpopular for a reason, because the country is heading in a negative direction, despite the fact that he has the wind sails of almost the entire mainstream media and most of the institutions in this country behind his back and he is failing abysmally and so i just think that it's clear that in the context of this debate even though i think destiny someone i like to debating and uh, has a, you know a gifted way of speaking i don't think that he's presented the case as why we would say that the biden presidency has been good if you're out there and you're on the left what would be his major accomplishment that you think he passed a bill that we have no idea will be good or not we don't even know how much influence biden had in forcing the infrastructure bill to be passed he may have been a liability in it getting passed and we don't know that the bill will be good or if it'll cause inflation or if it'll cause all sorts of other things hell most of us probably that at least me and probably destiny as well couldn't even tell you everything that's in the damn bill probably not biden least of all so yeah i just don't think that i think in the context of this debate that clearly biden has not been a success if you really hate trump you might say i think he was better than trump that doesn't make him a success i think it's been abysmal i think he was worse than trump and i hope that he turns things around because i do legitimately want the country to thrive even if that means that i have to eat crow because biden ended up being a good president but as of right now i'm being proved correct despite the fact that all these institutions pushed joe biden because he was this very sharp man that was going to be good domestically informed policy he's been a disaster Alrighty. <clears throat> for the I, the the idea of saying that a president has the wind sails behind their back is a very interesting way to describe the second democrat that has come into office inheriting a fucking national disaster from the prior republican president um, if anything this presidency literally started with biden trying to pull up the anchorage of the disaster and ruin left behind by president donald trump same as when obama came into office and was trying to repair the country and bring it back after bush left it destroyed after the 2007 economic recession I think that Biden has done the best that he can with what he's done in terms of how he's handled the coronavirus. We were ahead of schedule when it came to vaccines. The United States has donated more vaccines to more than every other country combined in the world to other countries. Um, Biden is doing what he can to push the country in a better direction in terms of keeping us safe, masking up, um, and doing what he can, which is limited. Um, I think that his handling of things like foreign affairs, Afghanistan, he finally fucking did it, okay? Every president since fucking Bush has talked about getting us out of Afghanistan, Biden was finally the one to pull the trigger on it. And we might try to second guess some armchair general on him now, but the reality is, is that as it stands today, we do not have a military obligation to Afghanistan. And that only happened because Biden was brave enough to take the difficult step to pulling us out of that country. I think that a lot of the issues that come up too are a lot of fear mongering. Uh, when people say that Biden isn't doing good or when crazy stuff is happening, they bring up stuff that's not necessarily true. So for instance, the idea that the FBI is acting in an improper way, they're not. They're looking into random emails and tips that they get. There's nothing wrong with that. The FBI can do that. They haven't acted improperly at all. That hasn't been demonstrated. Um, in terms of like foreign policy decisions, uh, the idea that like it was bad to bomb Syria when Trump himself bombed Syria, um, when, uh, when, when Biden had every authority to and every reason to, and when... Um, and, and when people in Syria are attacking our allies, I don't think there's anything wrong with what Biden has done in, our, in terms of foreign policy. I think that when you compare his foreign policy to what happened under Trump and even under Obama, I think people will look back finally on it. Um, and then when we talk about like the legislative accomplishment and we're saying, well, you know, we haven't seen how this legislation is going to turn out. We're literally not even done with the first year of Biden's presidency. And he's already passed the largest infrastructure bill in the history of the United States. You know, we have three years to go to see how this bill plays out and to see if any of the Building America back or the American Jobs Plan, if any of this can get passed. These are all going to be positive bills. I think that if we compare President Biden's approach to building the economy from the bottom up instead of Trump's approach, which, which was to tax cut the top and build it from the top down. I hope that we see more improvement under Biden because I think that's a better way to approach our country. Um, I think he did it with the coronavirus relief. I think he did it with the infrastructure bill. And I hope that he does it with more bills in the future. 
Okay, well, thank you guys both for um, joining us. It was fun. Um, and whenever you are done moving, Destiny, we got like, well, this one and then another one for you. So let me know when that is. Um, we are going to be doing a pop on panel after this. It'll be on a new stream. So for people who are wanting to join, let me know and we will get you on. So we'll be going for a while. Um, this is like the first stream we've actually been able to do on Twitch for a while because I knew YouTube might be Twitch friendly. <laughs> Most of our time, we're not. Um, all right. So yeah, thank you guys both for joining us us um and we will see you guys all in a little bit oh also the poll the poll is up in the community section on our youtube page so you guys can go vote on who you think won and um leave a comment no asshole comments um constructive criticism of course uh, yeah. the Good luck with this. absolutely shut up. shut up we'll see you guys in a little bit Good night. the um the biggest thing on rob is just being aware of it's always the same way you have to be aware of so many things and if you're not aware of them all it's so easy to like miss things because he will he always interjects like three or four things that and i think i caught i think i caught most of them because i've been aware of so many of the talking points but like fuck, it is so hard to keep track of like all the different things um uh, but i will say regardless of everything um my conversations with rob at the very least i feel like it gets my brain moving more than some of the past horrible fucking conversations i've had jesus fucking christ um, I, I hate to say it, but God damn, it was, it felt, it felt so much better to argue with him versus all the insanely stupid fucking conversations I've had recently. Jesus Christ. Oh my God. One thing that Rob is really good at rhetorically, and you can watch this and for me to counter it, I have to be kind of an asshole. Something Rob is so good at doing. Okay. I don't know if you noticed in the debates is Rob can make a point that's actually just completely factually incorrect. And then I can actually corner him on it and he will drop it very subtly and then move on very quickly so that it hasn't actually looked like he's lost any ground. He is really, really, really good at doing that. There was a couple times where I saw him do it and I almost thought about saying like, hold on, I want you to admit that you were wrong here. The FBI didn't actually do anything wrong. Um, but he's so good at kind of like summarizing his argument and getting rid of the more extreme parts and then quickly moving to the next point so that it doesn't actually look like he was wrong about anything he said, regardless, right? I'm not trying to insult legally in person. Um, but yeah, he's really, really, really good at doing that, um, which is interesting. It's, it's fun to find ways to, uh, something that's been fun while I'm navigating this conversation is to try to find ways to, uh, to maneuver around different types of arguments. I've been a lot more mindful of it. Like with that corn guy, I think I did really well there. Um, it's it's he's like an interesting debater in terms of that yeah wow colon slot thanks for the 10 gifted subs <clears throat> um i noticed that too but i felt like he was just trying to be less confrontational agree to disagree you can say that but like optically it gives the illusion that if you're not really super plugged in he was it feels like he was never really wrong on any point ever because he always summarized so like i might he might say something like this okay um <clears throat> All red cars are really bad. And I'd be like, wait, hold on. Um, here's an example. This Toyota car is red and it's actually a really good car. And I'd be like, okay, we, we obviously know that there's some red cars that are bad regardless. Um, <clears throat> but I want to talk about like catalytic converters and like we'll be in a totally different world. And it's like, he kind of sort of acknowledges that he was wrong, but he never says he was wrong. He will broaden it up and then summarize some of what he said before with a little bit less aggression and then move on to the next point. And it, he does it so well that you never feel like you're gaining ground. And the impression is always like, was I even right on that? Was he wrong, right? That's what he, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a really, I'm not criticizing him or calling him a liar. It might sound like I'm saying that. I'm saying that rhetorically, it's a very, very, very good tactic. He's very good at like, I guess like getting hit and then shrugging it off and moving right to the next step. He's really, really good at that. Um, when he said Biden presidency had more deaths than Trump's was a lie, they add early 2021 deaths. Um, is I don't know if that's true or not. It wouldn't surprise me because Biden's been president for the coronavirus shit when we've been counting deaths for longer, right? I, I, I don't know what the actual total numbers are for that or like when the days they came in. I'm never going to pick a fight on a number where I don't know 100% because I'm going to end up looking um, bad when I get called out on a data point and it turns out he's completely correct. I don't, I don't know what that is 100%. Um, is it January 6th? When or no, that was the... When was the inauguration? Is it January... 16th? Fuck, I don't even remember the date. Inauguration USA, January 20th. Damn, because we had a lot of really high death days. 
in early January. Damn, I bet this is pretty close. Um, is there an easy way to like, does anybody have the numbers? Biden bombed terrorists in Syria. Trump bombed the Syrian government, so you shouldn't let him compare those two. True. I mean, I think Trump bombed an airport, um, and then Biden did a, like a targeted strike of somebody sure. But I mean, technically both are attacking Syria, kind of right. Did you get caught in the quote of Biden saying he was angry about the Rittenhouse verdict? Uh, no, because Biden didn't say that when he came out of the plane. There was a, um, a statement that was released on the website differently, but when Biden came out, he was, um, he said he supported the jury. 